Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world, beautiful people. This is another episode of Kegos Free Thinkers Forum, episode 97. We're almost at the finish line to 100, which will occur within the next 10 days. And we have a very special guest for episode 100. But we have a special guest today that's going to be here within the next two weeks as well. His name is Matthew Witt. You all probably know him already. I believe this is his fourth appearance on Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. And he is a professor currently at the University of Laverne in Laverne, California, in public administration. And um, he's a friend in the pod now. Um, we've developed a friendship over these um, three episodes. And it's been a wonderful journey. And I'm glad that you all have had the opportunity to take that journey with us. And um, again, episode 97 is going to be a wonderful experience. We're going to talk about the Washington Mall. And this is a personal experience with um, Professor Witt and his family. His dad was the architect, Marvin Witt, his late dad, was the architect of this project. Um, there was a competition that went to D.C. We're going to learn all about it today. We're going to learn about um, the history of the monument, of the park, of the mall itself. And um, D.C., just kind of the aura around Washington, D.C., and um, I'm sure we'll mix some other things into this conversation as well. But I just wanted to say, Professor Witt, we appreciate you accepting that invitation again, and welcome to the show. My pleasure, as always, Kiko. Congratulations on number 100 coming around the bend. Yeah, it's coming around, but um, I just want to say this would not be possible for with all the support, um, the listeners and the viewers. Um, as you all know, this is strictly a YouTube channel now. I did that on purpose because that's where the traffic was going. That's where all the traction was. And um, people like the videos. People like to see the people and the interaction itself. I know some people listen to these conversations going back and forth to work. But um, I decided to make it a visual forum. And we're going to keep going with that format. I believe it's worked out fine for us. We've reached almost every country in the world. We have an international audience of a huge presence 45 percent of the audience as a matter of fact um folks is in on kiko's free thinkers forum so out of the percentages you have 55 percent stateside and the rest of the people who listen and follow the forum are located outside of the united states and so that's kind of the point we we'll always want to make this an international community forum and i just want to say again thanks for all the support we are officially monetized if you want to send donations or anything to the channel, you can. It's there um, on the YouTube right there with the money signs. You guys know how to do that stuff more so than I do. But I don't ask for your money. All I really ask for is a, for a subscription for free if you're interested in the material and share the content with your friends and your family. That's the biggest thing is sharing the content and um, subscribing to the channel for free. You may not like everything that's presented, everything that's said. But if you see value into the ideas, consider giving us a, a free subscription. And that's all we're asking for. We're not asking for your money, just for a little bit of your time to expand your mind. And remember, you can't unthink free thought. So let's keep this going with Matthew Witt, the fourth appearance. And we're going to talk about um, a personal um, experience with him and how this whole idea of the, the design behind um the DC monument, like what came into your mind when you was thinking about um, this project? Thanks so much, Kiko. Um, the, the project um, germinated as an idea in 2003. It would be eight years later that the opportunity materialized to um, flesh, fully flesh out uh, design as part of um, a monument design competition uh, for, for the Washington Monument. More on that in just a moment. Uh, 2003, I was visiting DC for the first time for a conference. Um, my, my first attendance with what is the um uh oh the venue the journal i the, the journal is a public administration review um uh and the 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 venue for the the conference venue now is escaping me um american association of good lord i'll it'll come back to me 
That's all good. I mentioned the journal because it was the journal Public Administration Review considered the flagship of American uh, academic venue for public administration scholarship uh, that would um, publish a piece that I wrote um, about the Capitol Mall uh, in 2005. ASPA. But our story begins... In, um, ASPA, thank you. American Society of Public Administration. Thank you so much. Uh, and the, the journal that it hosts, Public Administration Review, one of a couple of journals that it hosts um, would would be venue for, in a surprise turn of events for me, um, uh, that would publish the piece uh, that you read, um, uh, Ground Zero Democracy, or Amer American Pal Palimpsest, Ground Zero Democracy in the in the in the Capitol Mall in 2005. And that piece would be my first major piece. I had very small essays, uh, short essays in a in a theory venue that became very important to me in 2004. But 2005, I I, I debuted with uh, with uh, the the leading piece. It was they they had as part of their um, format then they had lead article format and I was a complete nobody um, just starting my career and 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 was published there not just there which would have been a huge um, laurel for a uh, assistant professor but as lead article and the reasons for that I, I could get into I think had to do with the um, the uh, the journal editor um, and and editorial staff, particularly sympathetic to the ideas, um, and uh, appreciated the hard work went into it. Whatever, but the inspiration came in two thousand three visiting the mall, and I was a year and a half into a career then, just getting started, and. Um, you know, I kind of practiced myself how I would talk about this with you because it is personal. Um, it was a very difficult time. Um, I uh, was very much a fish out of water in Southern California. Here I was this Pacific Northwest guy. Um, you know, I I I was I was very green. You know, I I was I was a good mimic. I was a good intellectual mimic reasonably good you learn how to do that as a grad student as you know well and and but i i uh, you know getting really grounded in in the relevance of ideas much less how to teach them is altogether different and and then there's you know where do you find yourself i was in latin america i was in southern california and i you know my credibility my cachet was really you know like who is this guy <laughs> I also would discover, but much you know later. Well, I entered not uncommon for academics to enter situations that are in turmoil and conflict, and there's nothing like hiring the next new guy that brings out divisions in departments. And our, my department was like a lot of others that way, maybe in some ways worse. Um, and I wasn't the first pick. I wasn't the second pick. Um, I was the remainder. Uh, and there was a consensus that among most of the faculty, they 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 would prefer me to the other guy, uh, who, who who only one other person. It was and and it was I was I wasn't aware of this at the time. I would learn this later, but the divisions were very clear, and um and it was very difficult and trying to figure it all out, and I um. I was also working through, yeah, relationship had ended sometime earlier before this personal stuff, and which, you know, is what it is always for everyone, traumatic. Leaving home that I, I didn't wish to leave, you know, but had to for a career. And, you know, finding myself very much fish out of water. And on the one hand, it's super exciting, you know. On the other hand, okay, now what? And the pressure's on. And 
uh, here I was in DC and it was, uh, it was, a, it was our own cataclysmic time for the country. It was, uh, it was while there at the conference, Bush, George Bush Jr. announced war with Iraq, you know, that we we're going into Iraq and there was, what's this going to mean, you know? Uh, and, you know, it would be the first war of the new era, uh, looking back. And, and so there was apprehension and all of that. And I was walking the mall with a couple of colleagues that I went with to this uh, conference. And I was, I got way ahead of them. I got very enthralled with it. And sort of, they were kind of behind walking slower. And I was just peeling off, but processing all this stuff. Part of which was, I, I neglected to mention, but you and I have talked about, and I brought up before in talking with you, was a continuous sorting through feelings and turbulence around uh, my own family history of my mother's surviving the Jewish Holocaust in the, doing, the Nazis. And so I've spoken about this previously. It, it's, it's very relevant here. Uh, in that, you know, who am I, right? You, when you're in an emotional crisis, you, often there's this incredible opening because you have to be to everything. And you have to be willing, the extent you're willing, to take a look at stuff that's difficult, painful, that has regret to it. It's whatever it is failed relationship here, you know, missed opportunity there, uh, took a risk, will it pan out? Don't know. It's looking 50-50 here. You know, you're, you're, you're sort of, you know, open. Um, and I found myself at some point, and I remember the bench, it was on the south promenade of the main um, axis of the mall, uh, just west of the Washington Monument, looking towards actually looking directly towards the cat, uh, the White House. And I sat there and I just, I found myself putting my head in my hands and just like, um, and I remember exactly what happened. As I'm sitting there um, ruminating, this sort of voice comes to me. I, I, you know, you're better, you're better than this. You're better than your circumstances. You're better than your circumstances. You're better than what's happening to you. You're better than all of this. And I won't, I'll spare you and your listeners the details of all what was happening in the work situation. And at that mo moment of sort of validating myself, at that very moment, came this as you've heard so many times from people say a flash of light, a flash of how many times you've heard people who have shared personal anecdote in one's life or ourselves have experienced it, a flash. And it's always a light, you know, it's always, and for me, it was related. It's almost like a bolt It just a bolt and a very, a very distinctive feeling that it didn't come from within. It came from without. I, this is, I'm not exaggerating. It started outside of me and it came down and zoom. And at that very moment, a vision of, and I'd been working through some ideas about race now, in part because I was very much feeling the fish out of water, Latin America, very Hispanic, very Latin, a uh, student body that was majority Latin at Laverne by then, um, adult students. That I was teaching, you know, with lives and going and their expectations for the classroom different than your 18 to 22 year old son. And, and there I was. And um, I've been working through this stuff. I've been working through my own family story and my mother's memoir entitled Passing or Passing as, as Half Jew and Not Fully Jewish. And the title was Passing, a trope that's very important in American history uh, for people of color. And I, I, I am working through this stuff, right? I'm sitting there and it's not, so it's not out of nowhere that this thought would come. I've been working. 
but it was I- immediately concurrent with a forgiveness of myself or a validation of myself. So I want to just put that out there for a minute. I want to keep this personal as we spoke in, in preamble to rolling tape here for why I want to do this. And your permission is very gracious. And so there it comes. And the image was of a arcing um, wall um, in front of the Washington Monument uh, that would denote words that were very meaningful to me from Martin Luther King's often repeated aphorism, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And so I I, I saw an arc in the grade westward of the Washington Monument that would that would would face westward toward the Lincoln Memorial but would connect the Washington the the the, the Jefferson Memorial in a sense of one and would connect it with the with the White House on the other it would sit just westward of the Washington Monument it would face Lincoln and this idea my I, I got my father and told him about this who is an architect and I said, I, I'm, I'm writing, and I, I was by then writing an article. I started writing an article. I have to go back. I believe I had already started an article on the topic, but it was, it was a total mess. And after this, it started to really take shape and get some movement forward. And he worked with me on the design that comes up in the article that you've read that would be the basis for eight years later, a submission to the uh, uh, an actual design competition for the Washington Monument, which has never been finished. It's what everyone knows it to be this uh, austere obelisk, but it's had many design proposals, some more grandiose than others, and it's considered by many who you know, design professionals and art historians and American history historians to not not be finished. But it's that that area, that geography, there's probably no more contested geography with the possible exception of Civil War battlefields in continental U.S. than the Washington Mall. The disputes over design over the planning, the replanning, the revisiting, the the extra monuments have been the most bitter disputes <laughs> ever. <laughs> um, they rival any dispute you can imagine. We're all familiar with when you know art becomes controversial, and and sometimes at its best it is, and sometimes at its worst it is controversial. So we'll put that aside for a minute. But the, that that competition had a lot of controversy around it, but it was really intriguing. And it was remarkable timing in a way. And so all of that to say, I was working through that. And, and if I could now say a little bit more than about this growth that occurred. I, I would speak years later with my sister about the difficulty I had with talking about our family history without getting so choked up that I couldn't finish it. And the, in particular, it, it, this, it wasn't that we were Jewish on my mother's side. It wasn't that she survived the Nazis. It wasn't, you know, the intricacies of the story. Actually, it was one particular episode. And so it was 12 years of horror. Um, terror and horror for people who were Jewish and and otherwise uh, under the terror of the Nazis, right? So, but, but there was this one episode after reading that just I, I, finally I had to give way emotionally. It was the recounting of when my mother's father was called before his fraternity in um, his German fraternity uh, in 1935, after the publication of the Nuremberg Laws, this was late in 1935, I believe. 
establishing the one drop rule one drop rule by the way for race designation then the nazis had adopted from the most the most severe and arcane um uh criteria of the of antebellum us the one drop and which drop right i mean, it's just so he had to give account for his marriage to a Jew before for a tribunal of his fraternity brothers. By then, he was he was in his early forties. He was a practicing physician. He was a decorated veteran of World War One. He'd been a medic, frontline medic. I think he had Iron Cross designation for valor, something like that. They gave out lots of Iron Crosses, so it's not you know. But it was, yeah, and he, the indignity was what it was, and the terror uh, of of what does this portend for going forward in Germany. And he's there at the tribunal, and he's you know giving account. It's humiliating. It's it's disorienting. It's terrifying. It, as he gives account, at some point, I don't know if it was upon the, the deliberation of the tribunal or sometime during, one of his one of the guys in attendance, an older fraternity brother, raises his hand and speaks. And he says, wenn, wenn in German, wenn der Schroeder raus muss, dann gehe ich auch. If Schroeder has to go, then I go too. And he did not know this fraternity brother prior. It turned out this guy was Robert Gaup. Gaup was a um, psychiatrist. By then older, he would have been, you know, maybe 60. And he had some renown in German uh, law for being, uh, during his career, he, he, he gained some fame for being expert testimony in a, in a, uh, in a, in a very um, controversial and publicized legal case. The legal case had to, uh, the, the decision was bearing on insanity, a claim by the defense of temporary insanity. And, and it, Gout was the um, consulting uh, psychiatrist whose testimony decided the case. Okay, I won't go into detail about that. But that was Gout. And that was the guy who said, if Schroeder goes, I go too. And They both left the fraternity, fast forward, before the decision was handed down. Smartly, my grandfather, um, um, my, my grandfather just, just left. He formally, uh, uh, I think, I um, notified them that he was rescinding his membership formally before they decided against him. And Gaup did the same thing. He kept true to his pledge. He he went because Schroeder decided he wanted to go. They became fast friends to the end of Gaup's life. Gaup gave a Bible to my mother that he inscribed that she kept her whole life. <clears throat> I don't have it. I think that my sister has it. I spoke with my sister, a clinical psychologist, Kara, and years later and we're close and I described to her that whenever i would describe this story for many years i couldn't finish it i i and to this day i have some difficulty finishing it without getting caught in my chest and throat and and it, right so for the whole i know my mother's story a memoir 
I've got it on my shelf and I, I know the basic details in the story, but it's that one episode. And I told Car, I don't understand, Car. It's been years since I've read it. And still when I say it, I get seized and I can't finish. And all my other siblings have read the memoir. It doesn't happen to them. I don't no one that I've ever that I know who's read it, and I know many people have read it, have ever said, you know, that one, right? So what's what's my problem? And she said, it's not a problem. It's it's uh, it's actually well understood. What is the uh what is this? It's not a syndrome, it's a it, I don't know how to describe it, Kiko. Maybe we can find a, a way to describe this. But we're all familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, this very famous diagram, maybe one of the most famous diagrams of social science. And, and, and I, Maslow was this considered this sort of yeah, grandfather of humanist psychology. The model is very hierarchical. It starts with the very basic needs for survival of food, shelter, water, right? Some throw in sex in that as a piece of survival. Um, and, and and then it goes up from there to security needs and 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 then you know social belonging and then ego uh, uh, ego growth, uh, culminating with this ambiguously denoted um, right self actualization, mm -hmm. and and but it's very hard. So you start with one, and when you're progressive, you go from the one you know it's. It, and, and and the notion is that you're you're moving onward and going and, and and particularly moving to the ego stage, which for most of us is where we end up. We tend to end our lives with still wishing we did more and and you know maybe some resentments for not enough recognition and you know the other person got hired for that got promoted and you know why didn't we and and didn't get you know it's just these sort of these stings and insults to, to ego it's where most of us get caught up really most of our lives it, it's it's and and i and maslow and others about said about the actualization you know, it's it's not so many of us get that get there it's not inevitable that we'll get there um it's as much a choice as anything else that we get there um okay whatever but the ego and and as my sister described it, for psychologists, the two phases of social belonging, which is considered by Maslow's hierarchy below, is something to pass through, and it's called a hygiene need. After you get enough of it, you don't want more. The difference between that and the ego strata above it is that there's always more to get. You know, probably not a little bit of addictive behaviors, particularly among people in high profile, actors, performers, artists, those types, addictive behaviors probably have more than a little to do with ego. I, for all of us, perhaps, but people really in high pressure situations, one wonders, okay. Whereas social belongingness tends to be a sort of horizontal affiliation with the people around us and fitting in and thinking of others and having a sense of humor about oneself and, you know, sort of uh, incorporate, always incorporating the other, sort of the social worker in us all, the ego becomes always sort of distinguishing and separating. And yeah. And she said the thing that that is well understood by psychologists, though not taught at all, certainly not part of the introduction to psychology canon, is another dimension of growth. And it is the sense that we have when we're inspired by awe. And she says that, that the, the typical formulation of this is, is being awestruck by, in a disembodied way, by great works of art or ideas or music or poetry and so on. And she said, though, but there's another way in which awe is inspired by actions, as with extreme courage. Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Spartacus, you know, if the list could go on of those figures that inspire awe by their actions. And she said, you know, that's what's happening, to, maybe what's happening to you when you think of Gaub. 
is is that he he's so foundational to our family story and who knows maybe our our existing at all you know and emotionally it might may explain that there that that affiliation that is beyond ego it's beyond that anything that could be transacted in basic ways with people around us it it takes you it it's it it takes Takes you both inward and and outward and beyond, and and I don't want to belabor this point, but I I found it very helpful for me to understand that episode. How is this pertinent to this white guy from Pacific Northwest trying to make his way in the Latin America part of the United States? His new career, you know, on the one hand, pretty straightforward at the surface of it. How did it inform the design of this monument? We, I look forward to us now moving forward into and, and getting into that. Um, but that's preamble, Kiko, that thank you for permitting me to share that, that. That when I say I had an epiphany and it was a very distinctive flash, it came, it did not feel like it came from me. Mm-hmm. I, it felt very much like it came to me. And I'm I'm not a, a religious person, particularly. I don't practice. I'm not observant. Um, I won't get into my personal thoughts about God and spirituality, but I I I have them. Um, and and I, I but for what what it's worth, that listeners may relate to in their own experience, it came from outside. It's absolutely clear to me that something came from elsewhere. Now, perhaps it's our physiognomy. Perhaps it's the prefrontal cortex just initiating a thought that goes down instead of instinct welling up. From I, I'm not going to speculate. I am going to say, though, that as with so many other people, prefrontal cortex or whatever these things start from, it was an absolutely distinctive feeling that it came from without. And I would say that... I'm pretty sure I'm aware of stuff that comes from me for the most part. And I'm pretty sure I know when thoughts start that I'm the author of them. And I'm, I'm saying that this was a thought that did not feel my own. It did not feel like it was my own thought. (laughs) Okay. But I was very receptive to it. So then the task came and and very obsessive and really anyone who wanted to talk to me, I, I mean, I countless people I, I started conversations with, I'm pretty sure started walking backward from me within a few moments when I would talk about the Capitol Mall, when I would talk about race, when I would talk about this place as a very special place, a, a very important symbolic place that needed to be better understood to, 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 to get at the essence of this nation's identity, its unresolved um, it's unresolved terrors and contradictions and obscene hypocrisies and cruelties. And that, that I, I would, I, I'd, I'd stop, drop everything and start talking with some others. <laughs> so I became pretty obsessed and following this and worked it through. It culminated with the article in the Public Administration Review, which we can transition to any time. But that's by way of the preamble to the influences that, that led to that. Well, Something that you described, just like when you were talking about your this personal story um, with the memoir, which is, um, and you said the name of it is called Passing. Passing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting because um, my audience, um, some may be familiar with that word, the one drop rule. Um, it was specific to Black people in the States. I think even to this day, the one drop rule in the historic context was only ever applied to black people in the United States. And you refer to antebellum South, which is crazy to think of. There's a book that I would recommend to anybody that's interested in this topic of the one drop rule. It's called Who is Black? It's a it's a beautiful book. Um, um, white and it has the U.S. flag and I think it's like scattery. Um, the way it looks, I think the author's last name is James. Um, F. James, I believe, is the author's name. But, um, uh, intriguing book. Another one is Interracial Intimacy, 
uh, Rachel Moran. Um, she's an attorney. I think she's based in L.A. I want to say she's based in L.A., but um, she was mixed race. Um, I guess for back then, she would have been considered mixed race. I think Mexican and um, a white parent and, and, and a Hispanic parent. But again, Hispanic not even been a race, but just an interesting book. It tells um, a lot about just the history of um, the race relations and the judicial implications of those, um, you know, different time periods and paradigmic shifts. Um, yeah. and, and it's really relevant, I think, to your story, um, definitely. But the thing that caught me just um, reading this in the audience, if they're asking, like, what am I talking about? And we'll get to some of the images in a second, like because Dr. Witt is going to show us some of the PowerPoint, um, the visuals about the Washington Mall, and just um, so people can kind of get an idea of um, this architectural um, phenomenon, this um, palimpsestic experience. Uh, if we can borrow one of the words that you used in the article, which I'm going to actually ask a question about. America's palimpsest. Ground Zero, Democracy, and the, and the Capitol Mall. Like, palimpsest was a word that was introduced to me through my literature program at UT Knoxville. Um, I'm curious how you came to using that word within the context of this article. Like, what does that word mean to you when you use palimpsest? That's a very specific word. And I know it's a word that we used to use a lot in debates and our courses when we, when we were in the PhD program at UT Knoxville in our literature program in Latin America, but I'm curious as to um, what that word means to you within the context of the article. You bet, uh, Kiko. A um, little funny story. One of the, the managing editor of the journal did not like the word. She did not want me to use it. She really? thought it would turn off. Yeah, she thought it would turn off readers. And I, I didn't argue too hard, but the, the, um, executive editor said it was fun so i it, how i forget now how i came across the word it's not one that i would use in any kind of common parlance or anyone really does you say it's sort of you know part of a theory lexicon i didn't come to it as you did uh i i've i i believe that where i came to it was from one of the authors i read a, a philosopher actually charles griswold um, who wrote a remarkably thoughtful piece about the Capitol Mall. And um, and I think it was from Griswold that I got the terminology palimpsest because it is land that, if, so a palimpsest is, I, I think, literally defined as a, 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 a medium that is used repeatedly uh, for uh, utilization of text. And in history, it was parchment because parchment was very valuable. And so, you know, they use ink that they could rub off, like a chalkboard. A chalkboard is a palimpsest in very simple, in simple terms, chalkboard. So the idea is a medium that can be used over and over and over for the conveyance of a text of some kind. Mm -hmm. And um, it, your theory may, may embellish that or embroider that or work with it differently. But this is the basic definition. And for me, that if I were going to describe that space in this sort of America a couplet, you know, America's what? What is this? America's what exactly? Well, it is a place of the repeated um, sort of um, uh, retracement of our story. And and that it and, and it went through these phases. You know, it went through these phases that I get into. And I have to say, um, and I don't know if I have the book on my shelf here. Just a moment. Mm-hmm. I will show you the book if I can with respect to the contributors who were such a major influence on that article. There's a marvelous book by historians of the Capitol Mall, and I don't have it here. It's cited in the article where I, I you know, without that book, there would have been no piece by me and no clear understanding of this sort of, um, you know, this epochs uh, of from, you know, 1790 something to, you know, 1965 and forward that denoted periods uh, uh periodicity of interpretation of the country and its vista and how that geography that mall space uh, could be utilized for expressing 
you know, um, extant ideas, you know, extant, popular, and timeless, and you know, uh, continuously resifting all of that, and that that monument space for many people considered kind of tired and yesterday and dead white male and, and you know, uh, plantation Greco-Roman architecture and all those things that it's, it's just that. I wanted to revivify and, and make clear how, but actually it's more than that. And so this is where, what I would do is a, um, read the monuments in a way that they talk to each other because clearly they do there is a there is a there's a narrative to the space and there's a talking to each other in a kind of uh, in a kind of way so that's what i get into in this sort of slides that i'll share with you is how there's you know I mean, this, they were start. I think they were started and finished in this, uh, the same period. The the Lincoln Memorial and and the Ulysses S. Grant, which mm -hmm. obviously are intended as book, they're they're literally bookends of of the east west axis of the mall, and they're looking right at each other, but through the monument that precedes all of them, the Washington Monument, they they have to look right through it. They don't look they don't look around it or you know they look right through it. And so what one can play with the ideas of that. This is what art invites us to do is where there are solid forms to see something other than merely solid forms. So, yeah. The, the palimpsest thing, I loved your um, explanation. That sounds pretty familiar as far as um, that would be like the, the raw definition of palimpsest. I believe it's a Greek origin word uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe the origin is Greek. And okay. um, theoretically speaking, it was always an interesting word to me because, um, and I'm glad you, you you incorporated it into the article because I honestly believe it made it a stronger article. And this is kind of the literary critic coming out of me. <laughs> I, 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 my wife always gets on me. She's like, damn, Kiko, you can't read anything without putting on your damn critic lens. And looking at it, I'm just like, I'm sorry, baby. I gotta, you know, that's the way I do things, you know. But but it's also the art part. I mean, art is always, it never escapes you. You know, you try to go to sleep, but the art wakes you up. And um, that's the way I look at things when I read anything, even the most, the driest of content to like the wettest of content. I'm gonna try to find a way to be like, okay, there's gotta be something to that, right? To make it cool or juicy or whatever it can't just be just a dry thought right you can always make it moisture than look moisture you know anything but i was thinking of um i guess the best way to describe it from a theoretical angle the palimpsest would be almost like if the word cryptic met geometrical figures because um i think of like the kind of like the old movies where you have the hidden room that no one knows about, but somebody knows the code and the the room completely, you know, there's a whole nother room behind that room. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the way we use palimpsestic in our program. Uh, okay. The whole idea of you can't define it, you erase it, you can add things to it, you keep erasing it. But there were there was a history before that erasure and no one will ever know, they won't be able to recuperate those ideas but the point is that's the tabula rasa. It keeps going. You know, you can erase it. It's an etch a sketch. I think you use that word in the article. I use the word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you're that's that's really beautiful what you share. That there's always a shadow of what was there before. It, 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 it what was there can never be entirely wiped clean. You you know how many how many chalkboard? I'm old enough to remember chalkboards. But there's even whiteboards, you know, they leave the trace behind and and you really have to work at it to clean it off. And pretty much nobody does. So that's beautiful. That's a beautiful way of of, ref, of reframing that. Yeah, thank I you. I want to show you, you can actually put a slice up now, but I was going to ask you kind of a burning question while we put a slice up and we talk a little bit about the design um, of the Washington Mall, the Capitol Mall. I was thinking, 
my biggest like thought that came reading this article had to do with the whole idea of Washington D.C. itself. Washington D.C. is a palimpsestic town. I mean, it's hard to define. Is it a? It's the capital of the country, right? It wasn't always the capital of the United States. No. It's in a palimpsestic region of the country. Mason-Dixon line, north-south. Right. The question of slavery. So my question right. to you, when you were there, did those thoughts ever get to your mind? Did I feel like I was in the south? Um, did you get a flashback to the, an earlier point in time when the Declaration of Independence would have already been written? And you had the Continental Congress and this whole question of slavery, all these, you know, founding fathers owning slaves. Does that ever go through your mind when you when you went to D.C. for the first time, this iconic, you know, space that you're in? I appreciate the point. And I love the way you put that is sort of the liminal space that occupies in, in Mason Dixon and um a geography of Mason Dixon and and uh, North South and beginnings and forward expansion and yeah I love that and, be, and I'm going to play with that when we talk further on the elements of the mall. Um, it didn't, you know, my first visit there. I've been there maybe what have I been there? I think I've only been there twice now, um, and maybe three times. And I I uh, three times I've been there. Um, but I, Kiko, the first time it struck me as a pretty urbane city. It had, had a nice human scale to it uh, by way of comparison to New York, for instance, that I was familiar with it by then. And, and I hadn't been to Chicago by then. I, I'm familiar with LA and so on, but it, 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 it had a horizontal, uh, architectural design, uh, syntax to it that has been very deliberate because the going back to its uh, going back to the day, it was determined that no building would be uh, so high as to eclipse a view of the Washington Monument. So uh, they've retained that um, they've retained that that ordinance, uh, historic ordinance for height limitations uh, in the city. And it gives it a human scale so that when you're walking the streets, you, you feel a bit of the colonial origins, mm -hmm. I would say. But I didn't feel the, the I mean, some of the urban design is, a lot of the urban design, the streets goes back to, to its original plaiting. And so, but I didn't, and you've got the monuments there that take you, you know, the mini monuments, um, the, the roundabouts that are in the center part of the city that take you back historically, right? But to answer your question, I didn't feel like I was in a Southern city at the time. I've been to other Southern cities, you know, Richmond very much struck me as a Southern city and it's, you know, not far at all from, right, DC. In miles, it's not far from DC. So, but I, I, I very much felt it there. I very much felt it in Atlanta, very much. Yeah, so, but I, anyway, straightforward answer no i didn't feel the southernness of the city so much as it was urbane and you know i liked it from a design architectural design planning standpoint because it was so walkable but i thought yeah. that your article made it i appreciate that um well i think you have to acknowledge obviously the historical um dynamics of the united states but i i thought your article had a great capture of um historical mindset even though you're not a, a, a historian you had a great grasp of um how significant that history plays into not only the architecture but just you know the city itself and that um you really can't talk about dc without starting with that because um no. is in a way dc is still being defined you know it's um just even with the whole idea of um, statehood, um, this idea of, um, you know, is it its own, is its own entity, you know, is not in Virginia, is not in Maryland. It's, right. it's just, it's a really interesting yeah. um, observation, I think, on your point, because um, I heard a friend, my friend J.B. Fabi, who's actually from Paris, France, he, um, 
he's very familiar with DC because his mom, I think, still lives in DC. But um, that's where he was before he transferred to Middle Tennessee State University. That's where I met him. He ended up getting his degree in sports management. But this French man was he's obsessed with DC. He loves DC. He loves the United States. Loves it, man. You would think he was from here if you take away the accent. <laughs> and JB, shout out, man, if you're watching this episode, um, Jean Baptiste Fabi. But he asked somebody asked him, I'll never forget it. We were at a party, and someone went, asked JB, is DC part of the South? They were asking a French person this now. They asked him his opinion, and he was like, I don't know. He's like, I don't know. I don't know what DC, you know, I don't have any, you know, concept of that, you know, being from France. But I thought it was curious because it's a question I've always thought about. I've never been to DC. Um, I have had some family go to DC. I think my sister's been to DC, but that's it. Like, I don't have any connection with DC really. But that's a question that's always brought up because a lot of people move there. It's a huge area. And there's always this idea of hiding history away. I've seen it so much. Um, People talk about the North didn't have any involvement with slavery, but yet the planters benefited from slavery, even if there were no physical plantations. And we know that there were sundown rules where Blacks weren't even allowed in certain areas after a certain hour. So slavery may not have been there, quote unquote, but it was also a Jim Crow-esque influence that was there, even in right. so-called northern areas. I mean, Oregon, they banished Black people um, for the longest. Um, you weren't even allowed to enter this, the territory of Oregon. But um, you have those kind of conversations around D.C. as an attempt, I think, to be like, OK, that's not what D.C. is now. D.C. is not the old Jefferson Davis, you know, D.C. This is a new modern cosmopolitan DC. It has yeah. no connection with slavery at all, but you kind of brought that into the article that no, it has those roots and it, and the kind of the attempt to get away from that history too. Yeah. Yeah. That comes up in the sort of uh, the lamentations, ruminations of, of designers concerned with exactly what you're talking about of, of, erasing uh that history from view yeah there was literally a slave pen right up until i couldn't tell you what year late you know civil war time a slave pen um i think it was outside the capitol um building and you sort of again you know this sort of that which was foundational to the country's political economy and but also had to be in some ways denied because of the hypocrisy and contradiction from the very beginning. Um, and what Mills does, Charles Mills does so remarkably well, is get at the the epistemological implications. Uh, and you know what came out in the Brown v. Board um, expert testimony, uh, psychological testimony about the harm done black children for this this psychic despair that that um uh that the boys got you know the 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 double the double consciousness in the soul of black of black folk that 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 psychic psychologists would call splitting you know you hold two contradictory ideas and you you're forced to hold them you know i am both human but not quite um we we are a history of freedom, but not entirely, um, and equality, but not entirely. Um, we're we're born for an equal, and yet we're 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 profoundly separated and made different. Um, we're we're Christian, and all souls can be saved, but the heathen lives in a liminal space. You know, these splitting you can take it back and around the globe in some ways, but back to our discussion is that Washington, D.C. becomes really very much a geographic locus mm-hmm. of it all. 
Uh, and so this mall space is very significant. And when you get into the history of it, it's extremely contested in no small part because of what we're discussing. And the design of the monuments in subtle ways, denoting the way art can get away with this, right? Denoting ambiguity, ambivalence, capturing this in, in, in marble, you know? And so I look forward to us playing with this, playing with the ideas a bit as, as we as we get into this and perhaps speculate on the sculptor's intentions along with you know the cottage industry that has been in this cadre of art historians for many years you know what what did they what were their influences what were they really intending what did they speak to in their own lifetime about what their intentions were and how much did they just let this let what their work speak for itself we can play with and caveat it doesn't mean to say that any of this is everyone's cup of tea as, right. you, as you opened our discussion, right? It's not not to suggest that. Our, we take as our task, and I think our intellectual work together to, to comb through some of this stuff. It's not, is as you know, right, as, 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 a, as a scholar, it, we, you can't, I often get asked in classes, you know, I've, that I've taught, well, what's your favorite movie, Was it, you know? this or that i'm like so so is this your favorite movie because you showed it to us like, no it's not my favorite movie because you're, yeah but you wrote this article about it it sounds like it's your favorite movie you talk about it a lot you know, like as i have brought up in our previous discussions the matrix I said, not exactly it's very useful mm-hmm. in many ways for working through some ideas and it's artful in its in its conveyance of those does it make it my favorite? Does I would give it every award on this? Not exactly. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, yeah, that's you. It's like your own. You, it's your, the paintbrush in your own easel. You have your own easel, and you can pick whichever color you want to use. You know. Oh, so, I love that. Yeah, but, using this whatever to. You know. <laughs> but pull up, um, pull up your PowerPoint so we can get started. And um, we can definitely talk while you're doing it. Um, you bet. My thing is, I'm trying to get, because, you know, you can't rely on Wikipedia for shit. You know this. And um, who's the person that was trashing Wikipedia pretty hard? Um, Helen Kriyinsky, I think is her name. And um, I'm actually trying to get her on the show because um, she contributed the penultimate chapter to um, Cynthia McKinney's edited volume, When China Sneezes. And I actually interviewed Dr. McKinney a couple of weeks ago, Love um, episode 95. So if people want to check out um, the former Congresswoman, six-time um, Congresswoman from the state of Georgia, uh, Cynthia McKinney, episode 95, it's on here. But um, I was thinking about Helen Kriyinsky, Kriyinsky because um this whole idea of Wikipedia says that the Charles Lenfant is pretty much the base of the DC um, mall. Is that true or not? Because your article was talking about how Jefferson and Lenfant were basically, it was contesting, you know, the two thought processes. You know, one was wanting a more cosmopolitan vision and Jefferson was wanting a more rustic um, he wanted to retain the kind of that vibe, the, the the former colonies vibe. So, so what is when we're looking at these images, you know, eventually, like what is it exactly? The current DC. Fair enough. And I pulled up some other images here of of faces that don't need introduction, but I, I'll get. I'll, I want to answer your question real quick. Um, so, Leon Font's uh, vision would prevail. Um, over um, Jefferson's, and I love how you put it, rustic. Uh, Jefferson's vision was, first of all, for a much smaller city in Washington, D.C., um, that he wanted to, that he envisioned platting. And he 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 he, he wanted the city to be um, emblematic of, you know, the the his his anti-federalist sentiments. And, and for itself to be modest in its uh, architecture 
and that the planning and beginning with the scale of it, not more than 300 uh, uh, square acres, uh, acres rather, that's already a square, uh, that 300 acre city and, and L'Enfant um, vision was uh, much larger um, and his platting would of the city would prevail and his his um, his uh, design uh, for he didn't design the mall L'Enfant he, he but he was a he was a major fat force behind what would become the layout of the mall mm -hmm. so yeah Another part of the history that's fun to geek out on and think about, and what was Jefferson, a Jefferson, you know, American Sphinx, right? Of of all our historic figures, perhaps the most quizzical, um, uh, uh, quixotic uh, um, figure, you know. On the one hand, right, this this um, this avatar of all things. Um, liberty, equality, uh, democracy. On the other hand, himself a slaveholder, and later in his life, as he discovered his own impecunious uh, practices were catastrophe for his household, stopped mm -hmm. talking. He stopped talking, writing, speaking about equality when he discovered that he could make far more money off trading in slavery than he could any of his inventions that he had tinkered over for so many years. And his, uh, in a very American biography, tried to figure out ways to make money. Mm -hmm. um, and he was he was a, a impecunious, if not profligate spender, lavish in his hosting of parties and his and spared no expense for his own travels. Um, and, you know, he died um, in serious uh, financial difficulty. The Smithsonian Magazine published a marvelous piece many years ago now. Um, I cannot recall the title, but that gave account of where Jefferson's, um, Jefferson's own sort of schismatic personality around uh, race, and equality and standing in the United States um, played out uh, in this episode where he discovered that he could make far more money after the um, after the embargo on the importation of of Black Africans, the the imposed scarcity on the commodity of human labor uh, uh, raised the raised the value. And he determined he could make a lot more money trading uh, in slavery than ever he could make in um, his, uh, you know, his, he had a nail factory that he tried to get off the ground to produce, you know, hardware for building hardware that didn't work. He had other, other ideas, right? He was a, he was a botanist. He was an autodidact in so many ways, spectacular and I get, I'll, you know what, I get into this a little bit in my presentation, so I'll leave off there. I wanted to open, if I could, Kiko, with a couple of quotations that capture something of the spirit of the enigma of race. Uh, Toni Morrison, uh, actually speaking in my alma mater, Portland State University, in 1975. I was 13 years old at the time. The very serious function of racism is distraction, she told us. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Maya Angelou, prejudice is a burden that confuses the past, threatens the future, and renders the present inaccessible. After reading Mills, I, I hear these words, you know, uh, again, uh, for um, it's through a slightly different you know, sort of tonality. I've used this, I'm reading from you a, a course introduction slides to a class I've taught for many years um, it called, um, oh, what is it? Urban Politics and Community for the Masters of Public Administration at Laverne. Um, other, <clears throat> other figures that had something to say, Frederick Douglass, of all consciences, let me have those to deal with which have not been bewildered by the cares of life. I do not remember ever to have met with a boy while I was in slavery who defended the slave system, but I have often had boys to console me with the hope that something would yet occur by which I might be made free. And this 
this passage popularly misquoted as, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. A refrain, by the way, which is repeated, and I think very saliently in the film The Matrix, when Morpheus, nominally a black man, Lawrence Fishburne, the actor, uh, it explains to Neo, uh, nominally a white man, played by Keanu Reeves, that uh, they have a rule, uh, they have a rule outside in Zion not to extract people from the matrix who are too old. Uh, it's too much trauma for the psyche to discover that the world you thought was so real and tangible and everything worth your attachments was a profound fiction. Mm -hmm. Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman in the Baki case, uh, writing, I suspect that it would be impossible to arrange an affirmative action program in a racially neutral way and have it successful. Uh, he says, to ask that this be so is to demand the impossible. In order to get beyond racism, we must first take account of race. There is no other way. Those these are some words that have just sort of that have left left an impression. Just a couple more from Karl Marx. Hegel remarks somewhere that all great world historical facts and personages occur as it were twice. He has forgotten to add the first time is tragedy, the second is farce. It's a common attribute to give to Marx only part of this quotation. So I dug up the whole of the original where he would say history repeats twice, first is tragedy, then is farce. This is the truncated attribution given Marx. This is the whole quotation. Faulkner, the, right, the, the um, dean of white letters of the South, shall we say, from his novel Requiem for a Nun, 1951 novel, Faulkner wrote, the past is never dead, it's not even past. And so here I give, for what it's worth, white and black from across the spectrum, a few quotations that to me are so salient in denoting the conundrums, the, the labyrinth uh, of, of history, psyche, and identity given such remarkable account in such few pages by Charles Mills, who I look forward to us having a talk about, but that I, in my sort of haphazard way as intellectual and educator, whatever else you want to call us in the tribe, have tried to cobble together over the course of my career. Um, and, and here's some of that by way of another preface to what I, to what I uh, would like to share. Um, the past is never dead. It's not even past. Pairs well for me here with Marx. Um, history repeats twice. Uh, first, it comes around as tragedy, then as farce. As I would say to my students many times, to distill this and make relevant, I would say, you know, all of that which led to the Civil War was tragedy. All of that which followed the Civil War was farce. So, failing to learn from the tragedy, we would perpetuate farce. Jim Crow. Jim Crow and what would follow would be the farce, as it were, the profound failure to assimilate the lesson of the tragedy. Mm -hmm. It can sound cloying on the one hand to say it, it by way of establishing some kind of framework for teaching some of these things, I have found it useful. Okay. I'll 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 stop share. Um I don't know if I shared that. Are you looking at the screen that I have here of those mm -hmm. quotations or you are? Yeah. I'll stop I'll stop share of that. Sorry I lost track. And I'll I'll now get with all of those preambles that you've been very patient, generous with, I'll get to this. No, um, no that's interesting because um it's great that the audience is seeing um and we're obviously anticipating Charles W. Mills, the philosopher, the late Charles uh, Mills, not to be um, confused with Nicholas Mills, that's mentioned um, a lot throughout the article, the historian Nicholas Mills oh, within yes. the Palimpsest article. So when right. people hear Mills, I don't want them to think that we're talking about Charles Mills, 
in the actual Cap de Mall article, but Nicholas Mills, a historian, Charles Mills is somebody different that we're going to talk about next week. Very good. Thank you, um, Kika. So what I'm going to share is what I eventually pulled together in 2011 to present an audience at University of Laverne, um, work that uh, we completed for this design competition for the Capitol Mall. Um, and and these slides are of that. And so I open with preface uh, quotations. I've never read Proust. Um, I just found, I just did a Google search and got help with some kind of string. And here comes Proust. The re real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. Daniel Borston, uh, uh, like a... Uh, uh, librarian, uh, 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 Library of Congress librarian and historian, the greatest obstacle to discovery is not ignorance, it is the illusion of knowledge. And then Friedrich Nietzsche, whoever looks into himself is into vast space and carries galaxies in himself also knows how regular all galaxies are. They lead into the chaos and the labyrinth of existence. Mm -hmm. the, the, the National Ideas Competition for the Washington Monument Grounds had this as its, as its charge and, and inspiration and directive. So the idea for this competition came from awareness that while the Washington Monument is the defining feature of the Washington DC skyline and the centerpiece of the nation's most symbolic open space, the design of the Washington grounds has never been fully realized despite two centuries of planning ideas. This competition will give Americans of all ages an opportunity to help shape a national discussion of creative and innovative ideas. A wonderful woman, one of those people you're lucky to work with in, in 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 any career in life. Uh, her name is Donna Bentley. She was a lead librarian, head librarian at the University of Laverne for many years. She's no longer with us. She passed um, not long ago, about actually fairly recently. It's been about maybe two years. She passed in retirement. She, she was familiar with the article that we'd speak about, the earlier, she was familiar with that article. And she was familiar that she recalled the presentation I had done for Black History Month in 2003, which I neglected to mention to you, uh, how much of this was on my mind. It said, I talked about, um, I talked about the film The Matrix, allegory on race, uh, race consciousness and, and lack thereof. And she saw that presentation. Eight years later, she came across a feed in her librarian flows of information across her virtual desk that announced this competition of, of, of the ideas competition. And she immediately thought of me. And as would be a, her, as would be her style, very generous to always recall and a classic, like, you know, born librarian. She would remember people, what they were trying to do, research and how to pull together their thoughts and ideas. And as a as a as a librarian works as a node, you know, to try and get relays of all this to bring, right? She remembered eight years later that I had given this presentation and that I might want to know about this ideas competition. And I I was blown away in many ways. And I remember that day immediately after talking to her and finding out about this, I think it was the same day, I called my father and I said, Dad, are you, first of all, are you sitting down, Dad? I need to know if you're sitting down. Because we had worked so hard together on producing the article eight years earlier. Six, seven, it was, the article was published five. We worked on it in 2004 and the ideas competition came in 2011. It was seven years. And he said, yeah, well, what do you got for me? Well, get a load of this, Dad. It was one of his expressions he would always say well will you get a load of that so will you get a load of this dad you know that article you know that we worked on yeah oh yeah sure i remember that well guess what <laughs> turns out they want to do design competition <laughs> mm -hmm. and what do you know but we got a design that's anyway halfway ready for it. what do you say dad we pitch in for this and thus began a very very personally exciting fulfilling time late in my father's life and to work very closely with him and something he was very proud of. He was very, very proud of this work on the on the Washington Monument for a variety of reasons. 
I can run back to, I'd like to get back to my father's own experience with race. Growing up as a kid, displaced from Texas, Panhandle of Texas, coming to Portland, Oregon. <clears throat> and um, once he, he grew up in the neighborhood, they started out in the neighborhood that was, <clears throat> it was working class. It was also the sort of black quarter of Portland. You mentioned how racist Oregon was at its founding. This was 1937. My father uh, was a ball player as a kid, and um, he was pretty good at pitching. And one day coming home from school, one of the bullies at uh at school, followed him home and, and started beating up on him as an older kid started beating up on him. Jealous for his pitching talent, something like that was a story my dad would tell. But one, I, I don't know from where came uh, a kid to pull this bully off of him, happened to be a black kid, neighbor kid, pulled, pulled this kid off my dad. And uh, dad, he never forgot that. Um, he would later play ball um, in a uh, I forget, it was a very amateur league before he went to the service and he talked very fondly of playing with the, uh, with the black, in, you know, they would play, it, they, it wasn't the same league. This was still, this was still Jim Crow America. Mm -hmm. um, but he, he recalled playing games across their, with their league and, and his pitching style, he recalls saying how amused the players were uh the Disney the black players were by a submarine pitch they would they they were so amused they could all, almost laughing too hard to get up come up to the plate when they saw him pitch <laughs> um a longer story but so for my dad race was something that went way back to himself being a kid coming up um coming up starting out coming up pretty hard uh in portland oregon and uh and so on um that's the preamble to the story. I, I, when I present the University of Laverne, I say, well, you got, you know, get an idea of where we're going here. The University of Laverne main camp's about um, 30 acres, give or take. And to get people's head around the scale of, of what we're talking about, the, um, the, the Washington, Washington Monument Plaza is itself 60 acres, part of a much larger complex that's Washington, that's the Monument Mall but it sells 60 acres, so roughly twice as large as the main campus where I've worked my career, but large, but essentially empty, right? And I say, so it seems mostly empty, and my way of getting going is, but is it actually empty? To get back really to our whole discussion, it's full of your points about D.C., the space, the geography, where it stands historically and continuously. By way of that, um, it's, it's the topography is very relevant and, and it gets into my, into the design ideas for it. Um, and so what I'm sharing with you, Kiko is not from the paper of 2005. It is from the design competition, which was a, was a substantial enhancement of that design. So the obelisk sits on top of a mound that was graded artificially for that purpose. Um, it slopes about 40 feet above uh, floodplain level. Uh, the Potomac River is just, you know, the Potomac River is westward of here about half a mile. It flows with my air, my cursor, something like this. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're talking floodplain. It's, it's low, very low elevation. And it was built upward to, right, to, to in the event of, not on infrequent flooding. So um, so it's on a mound and the grade you can see is at that gradient, uh, about 15 feet uh, across this gradient upward in in more or less every direction. The apex is the is the plaza for the for the obelisk. And so you get started, you know, where we are located really depends. And this gets back really to your enigmatic point about DC, its, its geography and, and historicity. Where we're located depends on what, what we can see, what's in view, how we situate ourselves in context and our sense of direction. Um, are there ordinal points? And I say, as I say, a compass can be a very valuable, very tricky because you can get good and lost with a compass. There's that great line. It, it may be apocryphal. It may be just written in by Spielberg for, for his film Lincoln. But the exchange between Lincoln and the great abolitionist whose name is escaping me, but that exchange with Tommy Lee Jones, who's who plays the character of the senator. That's his name. 
And they're having they're they're in the kitchen in the White House and they're talking about how to get from here to there and and you know um the to to get the um 13th Amendment passed, I think it was. And and you know, Tommy Lee Jones playing the, the abolitionist ardent that you know you have to do the right thing all the time. And Lincoln saying, you know, it's great for you to say that, but you know, you can follow a compass and figure out where north is pretty easy. But getting from there across swamp and treacherous landscape and any number of pitfalls is a whole other matter. If you head north, not taking into account the landscape in front of you, all sorts of things can happen to you. So we can agree on what north is and that we ought to get there. But how we're going to get there, that is a whole other discussion. Do we agree that we have to discuss that also? <laughs> so. It may be apocryphal. It may just be for cinemagraph. I'm not the historian to tell you, and I haven't looked it up. Um, so I, I start, Kiko, with at the Washington Monument to gather a sense of these ordinal points. Uh, there's ordinal points in north, south, east, and west, which are very important for understanding the narrative, it would seem, that denotes the mall, at least as I'd like to convey it, and as many people I think um, understand it, as Charles Gridwall, the historian that I cite, who is very valuable to me in schematizing my thoughts, came to conclude that clearly the Civil War was the dominant uh, historic motif given account, and all that the Civil War uh, uh, contended with and portended for the nation is is foundational to the to the design of the mall at least at least beginning in the night in they but the 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 what the, the Lincoln Memorial and the Ulysses S Grant Memorial were both started and finished same years 1912 1922 so from the standpoint of you know before then it was just Washington Monument and it was Washington Monument and it was a, it was the Capitol and it was the White House there was nothing else and it it had various designs as we've talked about and we'll get into but in terms of the major monuments they weren't there until 1922 the Jefferson Memorial wasn't there until 1938 I believe so people may want may go wow was that late was it, mm -hmm. yeah it was that it was that late that the mall that you take to be just sort of there and always there actually began so you start by looking eastward the rising sun the capital and it's the ulysses s grant memorial and so a little bit about that built 19 took 10 years the sculptor was uh, henry merwin schrady he lit he died the year it was finished of actually stomach cancer uh, he spent 20 years working on the memorial preceding its commission in 1912, including undertaking for himself intensive equestrian anatomy study. Schrady, I mean, beginning with Schrady, Schrady was a very controversial selection for the design uh, principle of this monument. He had no sculptural training. He had, he was, he was, he was criticized as just being a patronage pick because he had family connections in Congress, he he had, he was he was a nobody. He was a nobody uh, in in art circles. Uh, how did he get the commission? So uh, historians could tell you a whole bunch about all of that. It's it's I'm just putting it out there. It's interesting, and then we'll take a look at this and we'll ponder for ourselves if he earned it. So the scale is misleading because it's not a continuous monument flight, right? It's part of this plaza, but the plaza is 252 feet wide, about 71 feet deep. The equestrian statue of Ulysses S. Grant is itself 40 feet tall on a pedestal that's already, you can tell there's a scale of people standing mm -hmm. there. So that's five to six feet standing right there. I should know how big that pestle, pedestal is, but who cares, you can get a sense of it. The, from, from here to here is 40 feet. So from there to there must be close to 40 feet, 80 feet up from what you're looking at. It was one of the, still one of the largest equestrian statues in the world. The distinctive, distinctive features called attention to as we take a look is the hyper-realism of animate emotion, rearing horses, flaring nostrils, pricked ears, terrified faces of infantry. 
basically denoting ambiguous signification of war. Here's looking westward, and there's the monument, 555 feet tall. Uh, it took 44 years to complete the Washington Monument starting 1840, wasn't finished till 1844. It has an extraordinarily controversial history. Uh, it, there was, um, before, the, uh, before the blessing of it by the Pope um, in, I forget what year, um, major uh, enormous uh, uh, stones that were to be part of the construction disappeared from the site and no one could ever find them. Um, the know nothings were uh, suspected of of this vandalism, uh, and because of their very anti papist uh, uh, ideological mm -hmm. Christian affiliation, ext extremely anti papist, anti Catholic, um, and I I mean reading this history, I broke out laughter more than once at the absurdity of the of the of the absurdity, but the on the, on the one hand, but the the ex, the extravagance of emotional attachment to this place, mm -hmm. and what and what people did in the fights, the bitter bitter fights. Schrady almost certainly died. His complications from from cancer were were from the stress he incurred pulling off this commission. Um, okay, so we've got the the key the key stations of the of the design are uh, the center of it is is grant himself on his horse cincinnatus and then on the on either side flanked by these um by the statuary on one side uh uh caisson uh being pulled um into battle uh and on the other side a cavalry charge and we'll take a closer look at these uh, to get a better sense of what's going on with them. I had a quick question before you continue that actually alludes to something that you just mentioned about the contentiousness, the history of um, um, the obsession of the grandeur of the space itself. Um, obviously, it's very personal to a lot of different people, and that's why you have these attempts to claim and reclaim the space, and yeah. people okay. want to do things, you know, with the to watch them all, you know, get special permission and stuff. Can you tell the audience or um, just briefly explain what the Commemorative Works Act of 1986 was and what Congress did afterwards? Yeah, um, so the, yes, the, the Commemorative Works Act was a reaction to uh, the Vietnam Memorial. Uh, controversy. And the realization by uh, congressional leadership and its influences that the Washington Mall was vulnerable to an endless stream of interpretations and, uh, and which were well and good enough to keep to keep it alive, but the pressure for new monuments, and the concern that this, this uh, cherished geography of American history that had been sanctioned and approved over the decades since the these this the Grant and Lincoln came in in 1922, and the realization by the historians who would almost certainly be briefing Congress about this, that you know there this was no small amount of bitterness even to get these monuments in. Never mind one over a war so controversial as Vietnam, mm -hmm. and and under extraordinary pressure, Congress had capitulated to the Vietnam Memorial, but then there was the blowback of that design by Maya Lin, uh, from among others a a um, a, uh, a a sculptor who had cultivated the patronage of uh, Ross Perot. Um, uh, right, the Ross Perot, uh, the contender as an independent in the 1992 um, uh, presidential campaign, and you know, you know, who who distinguished himself as a a staunch supporter advocate for missing in action uh, personnel of Vietnam War 
And that's how he, that was his, his public profile. He made his millions actually in government contracts uh, for a guy who had such negative libertarian things to say about less government that he became wealthy through government contracts himself, not unlike Elon Musk and many others who, who, who I'm not criticizing them, right? But who often just who create profiles of themselves as these staunchly self-made and and you know sort of with tendentious relationships to government mm-hmm. uh, authoritarianism in fact made their bazillions off of government contracts various kinds of okay whatever mm-hmm. um the yes the commemorative works act was an attempt to constrict and 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 um and and sort of um bracket the terms and conditions for how the how monuments would be considered for um uh, you know um for review and eligibility to be considered for for the granting of commissions it was under bush and one of the catalysts for the article i wrote would be the amendments to the commemorative works act which took it a step further whereas the commemorative works act established you know sort of parameters that placed restrictions on on what kind of monuments could get considered and was in very much intended as a flywheel mechanism to slow down the popular adoption of 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 you know entitlement to have your favorite monument and they had been they had been deluged with monument proposals from all sorts of quarters for this or that favorite president this or that favorite cause this or that and and understandably, Congress had to do something. And that's where the Commemorative Works Act 86 came from. Mm-hmm. It was Bush in 2003, right at the, in my, where I entered the, my biography enters here, who had passed amendments to the Commemorative Works Act, which excluded any further interpretive work built in the primary axes of the mall. Uh, denoted as precincts as the precinct one of the mall. And that was the East, West, and the North, South, which we're getting at right now to describe. No more commemorative works. That was it. Vietnam got through. We should have would have not let that happen. We've got more works that are coming in. No more. Mm-hmm. Now they denoted then precincts two and three as open for interpretation because they knew the Korean War Monument, the the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Monument were in the works. And by then also in the works was a monument to Martin Luther King, Mm -hmm. which is now there. I was aware of this at the time. And part of the getting back now to the willingness of Larry Terry, who was the chief editor of Par, Public Administration Review, and Camilla Stibbers, who was the managing editor, part of their 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 willingness not just to publish this, they liked the article. I mean, they weren't going to publish it, but it didn't cut the muster. But they published it as a lead article. And I think that was political in part, because they knew that this was going on. They knew that this was, they knew Par had um, significant profile for D.C., De- the Dennis, the political denizens of DC, and they they use it as a statement. I, I think that I think that was intentional. I okay by me. Um, they never so much as said that to me. Of course, they allude, but Camilla Stivers uh, did allude to that in correspondence to me at some point in email. She was a very significant theorist in the crowd that I got ensconced with huge respect for her and her work. She's done a lot in feminist theory for public administration, et cetera. So, but she was managing editor of PAR at that time, considered a real accomplishment for the cadre of people who, who were sort of the expats of convent, but what they call conventional public administration theory to get her into the house of very conventional public administration review was, was considered a real accomplishment. And it was. Anyway, back to this. Boy, this dredges up all sorts of memories, probably way too much geeking out for your listeners. No, okay. you're good. <laughs> back to this. Here's one view of, of the part of the monument that um, this is actually to the south of a charge, uh, a, um, 
a artillery with caisson charging. But what's denoted here is the chaos. And the chaos is the motif that Schrader, that Schrady was really drawn to about war and the ambiguous um, circumstances that it always finds, it always produces in the midst of battle and the tragic elements of this. And so here you have denoted on this side, you have a flagman. It's not clear to me whether he's been shot and he's falling falling backward. And I, I'd have to get back into the art historian's understanding of this. He certainly, we'd know from the expression on his face if he'd been shot. But he is, it is a contradictory pose. On the one hand, he's got the flag, he's got his horse stabbing the ground to stop. But he's got his his flag, his signal flag, back as if to prompt forward, right? Mm -hmm. Now hold that thought. Uh, sorry, we're going to go. Uh, we're going to go previous. Previous. In this side of the charge, there's the flagman's face on the other side. There's his um, his signal flag. Um, here we have. Uh, the contradictory action of the horses. We have, like his horse, the um, the back horse of the team is stabbing the ground to stop. But the lead horses, both of them, are charging full tilt mm -hmm. forward. How did they get to make signal? So what's it, the, the signal harness here, whereas this one is intact, this is the signal harness that pulls back to stop. It's 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 engaged here. Stop. The signal harness here is broken. The horse did not get the signal, and the the horse accompanying it follows. This this is the horse that I that has the 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 stop signal, and I think the horse accompanying it is. Is follows the horse next to it. I'm not. We could go back and see if it has the same harnessing arrangement. I'm not a equestrian. I couldn't tell you exactly how they harness horses. Uh, but but we very clearly the signal to stop has been broken, and this horse has not got the signal, and it's charging forward. Okay, that's for what it's worth. Who cares? So what? Let's take a look at the next. This is a cavalry charge, which is on the other side of the plaza flanking Grant. In this cavalry charge, we have um, a uh, guy leading the charge with his uh, saber up, and but directly in front of him is a fallen is a fallen soldier, mm -hmm. fallen rider. And um, he is oblivious. He clearly, he's, his, 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 he's clearly oblivious. His horse is not. His horse is eyeing the situation and is already steering around. Mm -hmm. This relationship between the horses and the figures on them is central to this monument design. This, this extreme animate force that the horses really are the ones who register what's happening and the chaos of it and the reactions to it and the physicality of that is what to me in completely enlivens and defines this monument um plaza so a co co composition so here is the fallen rider the other riders have no idea they haven't seen it but again this horse's head is is tilted as if to notice this horse's body is slightly contorted. It looks like it may be rearing to jump over the situation. Uh, the horses are registering something that the riders haven't yet quite figured out because they're distracted by whatever else. In fact, get this, the face of this man was sculpted to be the face of Schrady himself. Why would Schrady depict himself as a fallen soldier about to be stampeded to death in a charge. Melodramatic, you know, um, you know, a dark comic sort of commentary on what it was to survive this commission. Um, you know, a 
recollection of Michelangelo's own depiction of his face, St. Bartholomew, uh, um, Flain, you know, and the face of Michelangelo sort of rolled, contorted, rolled up in that, in the in the final judgment of the Sistine Chapel, the artist mm -hmm. depicting himself tor uh, tortured by the whole thing. I, I, I don't know. Don't know. But for what it's worth, there, there it is. There's a close-up here, horse down, arm around the horse. Um, the physicality to me is just really striking, Kiko, and the hyper-realism of this. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, this is 1922. This, of course, is, this is on the, ver I mean, German expressionism was just about to take off in a big way. I, it was never popular in the United States. Um, uh, and, and in sculptural work, not for many years. Uh, I'm not trying to make a point here, but the the what genre of art this uh, this fits within? Again, I'm not the historian to tell you, but I, my reaction to it is it's hyper real, um, mm -hmm. uh, almost to the point of melodramatic. Yes, yeah, amazing. So then, um, that's a that's a. Now, can you tell the audience what that was that they were watching again? The this was a Ulysses S. Grant, and I'm not I'm not quite done with it, so I'm I'm gonna yeah, yeah. Um, I'm gonna hold hold off. I I haven't um, I need to get back to the Grant itself, and I I need I should have a closer up of him, but let's um, for, beg pardon. I'm gonna back up here. Because then there's Grant, who's in the middle of this. And you say that this is 40 feet in height? The, these, oh no, thank you, Kiko. The um, the flanking statuary is life-like precisely. And and the the it is Grant who is larger than life. These are, these horses are to scale, horse scale, and the riders are to scale grown men maybe standardized for the Civil War, a little bit shorter. But when you walk up to this pedestal, this pedestal is, I think, at five feet, maybe six feet. You are literally walking under the horse hooves, stretching right out over you. Mm. So it's obvious what's intended. You are being inducted to the scale of battle itself. You're being, mm -hmm. you're being, you're being transited through a space as if you're in the battlefield yourself. But in the middle of it, and very importantly, is is um, Grant himself. So let's talk about this for a minute. He's on his horse, and I don't have a close-up of his, of his face, I'm sorry. Um, but he's got his, Grant was renowned as incredibly, um, incredibly calm in battle. I, I, he had this preternatural steadiness and calm and determination. And as a as a soldier in the in the uh, Mexican American War, it was their story again, maybe perhaps apocryphal of him, but his his bravery second to none. Okay, whatever. So here he is, general, and he was and he's sitting on his horse in the midst of chaos. So again, artistically, there is battle swirling everywhere in the in the uh, in the in the dramaturgy of this of this uh, sculpt, sculptural set. There's chaos everywhere. And there's him in the center of it, completely stationary. And his horse is stationary, except for two things. The horse's head is tilted while he looks dead set forward. And what is he looking at? He's looking dead on center to the Washington Monument, which is three quarters of a mile westward. His horse's head is slightly tilted left. Left happens to be southward here. So this is leftward here is to the south, and this is to the north. Head is tilted southward, not an accident. Ears are pricked. So again, you have an equestrian statuary here of extreme animate emotion, force, power, some would anthropomorphize this as you know, courage, animal courage. I don't think I'd take it that far, but you, you know, I think the sculptor is very disciplined 
including of which is his himself intensive study of equestrian um, anatomy. He wanted to know the sinews. He wanted to know the bone structure. He wanted to know everything about horses before he did this sculpture. He had in mind he was going to have this commission 10 years before. This is amazing. It looks almost like it's moving. It's a moving image, even though it's a statue. It feels very much like it's moving. And and you were inducted long before Cinemax, no Cinemax, before IMAX, much <laughs> less VR, much less any of that. You were drawn in in a in an early 20th century way, in a in a, in a kind of diorama way, to be right there. Mm -hmm. Now here is, but here then on the pedestal that's itself we guesstimated 40 feet tall uh, uh, and a question statue that it, it then has another 40 feet on top of. So whereas you're, you have a very human scaled experience, your relationship to, where do you go? Whoops. Sorry, dog. No, you're fine. Your, your relationship to, to the man himself is remote, detached, um, um, uh, deracinated you are very small compared to him. We'll hold that thought because it's a theme that repeats in the statuary that we're gonna look at here. Grant is looking dead set ahead. He's got his broad brimmed hat. I don't know if it was military issue. I don't think, I don't know if it was. Sometimes you see him pa painted with a military issued hat, but he, this is a broad brim. It looks pretty, pretty dog, dog eared, dog bitten. And the brim is down, and you really can't. The shades his eyes. Whereas, whereas the faces of the men in the on the on the flanking statuary are are quite animate and expressive mm -hmm. in parallel with the horses that accompany them. Grant's face is stolid, expressionless, not unlike his horse. Prater naturally calm, in the midst of turmoil and battle. And this is 1922, so you hold that thought. And here, paralleling the, the stolid, almost placid uh, attentiveness of Grant himself, his horse, his horse's only register of the situation is the head tilted and the ears pricked mm -hmm. to the south, 1922. This is 1922. Uh, from Reconstruction, well into the 20th century, one would, would, one would have to say continuously on the one hand, but in distinctive ways in the Reconstruction era, the 20s were very turbulent uh, for a variety of reasons. And, you know, the symbolism here would not be lost on the that the horse is his head is turned southward and that its ears are pricked the horse like here in the center of the statuary as with the horses otherwise in the in the composition has its own praetor national instinctual awareness of what's going on in ways that can't be talked about that can't be written about that cannot quite be expressed otherwise and I think the genius of this stat of this of this um, monument, and it's not the favorite on the mall by far. The people go to the before the the Vietnam Memorial has been the favorite, uh, the, the the hands down favorite internationally and nationally since it was built, since it was completed in eighty six, um, uh, continuously. Before that was the Lincoln Memorial. The Lincoln is now the second. Since the Vietnam Memorial, the Lincoln has been the second most visited. The Grant is probably the least most visited, I would dare say. In the first time that I went to D.C., I didn't even know it was there. No one said, you got to see the Ulysses S. Grant. It's only when I got into writing this paper, this article that I went and saw it. I was like, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. And so here we have his horse. Head, there's still something coming from the south, and because it's statuary, it's there forever. It's nominally there forever. It never moves. It is a mute vigil 
forever of something happening, of signaling something. That's the power of statuary in my mind. One power of it. And the ears are pricked, right? The ears denote this attention, attention. The horse is not looking the same way as his rider. The horse is under its own volition. The horse is registering its own cognition, as it were. A horse is paying attention in a ways that escape the rider's attention. Very like the other statuary in the, in the composition. The horses are capturing something. And at the center of this is the most intellectual moment of the horses, right? As it were, the horse is in this calm, a nominally calm situation. And in a very subtle way, in a very subtle way, it's picking up a message. We can play around with what that message could be, but it's no mistake it's to the south. No mistake it's looking forever that way. All right. And, and there's Grant, renowned for his calm, right? He's in the center of this. He's bigger than life. And he's forever in his vigil, not north, south, or east, but to the west. So let's play around with that for a minute. He is at the foot of the Capitol building, the legislative branch of the United States, where representatives of all states gather to deliberate forever and continuously and, and laboriously and, and in, in, with infuriating failure to achieve as much as we'd like them to, captured by special interests, we could go on and on with our criticism. At the foot of this building, the Capitol, is Grant. At the center of a charge where he's looking westward. Is this saying something about the martial character of the nation headed westward into the 20th mm -hmm. century? Is this saying something about unfinished manifest destiny? Mm -hmm. Is this saying something about um, the times, as all art does, even when historically situated, of its own time, as all as all literature does, as all science fiction does? As science fiction is only nominally the future; it's always a commentary on current political circumstances. Yeah, is that what's going on here? I, uh, again, I love art that defies a definitive. Conclusion. <laughs> Otherwise, it's propaganda. If it's if it's one definitive conclusion, it's propaganda. You, surely, the one essential criteria for art is that you cannot attach a singular interpretation on it. But there it is, the suggestion. Looking westward, it's at the foot of the Capitol. They didn't put Lincoln Memorial here. They put Lincoln Memorial to the west. Mm -hmm. So let's Let's play with this. Let's move onward if we can. Bro, How's bro, our keep, time? Keep keep yeah. this right here. We got about a half hour, like st about strictly a half hour. But um, okay. I want to say that this, the grant posturing is a just is a just position in itself. Um, my initial thought was like manifest destiny. Maybe he's looking west, but I'd be curious to get like a back angle of him because. You could also make the case that he's almost lifeless. He almost looks like a cadaver, and the horse is in control of the situation. You know, with the with the posture, it's almost like he's holding on to the horse for dear life, and he's just there on top of the horse. He's literally just there on the horse, just sitting there. My, my first impression was he was a ghost. My first wow. impression... Uh, seeing this was he's like a ghost sitting on it. He, mm -hmm. he, he's almost like as a cadaver, an apparition. It's just something about him isn't quite there, mm -hmm. you know. And 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 well, you could say that of any statue of a biographical figure, it's like a ghost, in in a manner of speaking, I guess. But to your point, there's something so inert mm -hmm. about how he's situated. So let's play. Let's move onward if we can. I'm, I, I hope, I don't know that I can make it 30 minutes. And with your indulgence, maybe we come back to this another time. No but, doubt. Yeah, we definitely probably we'll, will. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll move on. So I didn't know, you know, I, I sort of try to capitalize this as the catastrophe that always accompanies war and its ambitions is, is one sort of, you know, um, theme going on here. 
that we've seen this, we've seen this, we've seen this. And so I try to size it up. Grant, is he a forward scout? Is he a sentinel? And maybe he's both. Yeah, he positioned at the base of the Capitol. He's like, he's ghost-like. Uh, he's a ghost-like forward scout. He's a standard bearer in perpetuity for Congress and its lawmaking for a nominally United States after the hostilities of civil war. He could be that also. I, again, I, I I love your take. I, 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 and I see, I totally sympathize with that. I say, and I talk about his horse standing still, its head jutting southward, indicates he's maybe a sentinel or a sentry. He's standing watch with his horse, which is paying at least as much attention to circumstances as Grant does himself, that there is a primal witness signified by the equestrian composition of the entire group. And it's an extraordinary touch, artistic touch. Antebellum sentiments in the South were not by 1922 dead and gone by a long shot. Division of one kind or another will always threaten the country and Congress. The way forward is uncertain. The terrain is perilous. The choices arrayed for any given generation warrant judicious restraint and constant vigilance. Grant shows restraint. His horse shows vigilance. I, again, I am just playing with ideas here. If he's if he's more than a ghost, maybe what he signals, as he did in his own life, attributed by many, a restraint. You know, on the one hand, he was a very fighting general. On the other hand, you know, he took his he, he took the measure of things carefully, for what it's worth. Moving well, yeah, onward um, to the Jefferson, nineteen twenty two, for sure. Um, the birth of a nation. Um, that was night. The film came out in fifteen. So, um, you obviously the had Gibson? this is very much a part of the fabric of the country. Very much part of the fabric and consciousness of the country, and with the urbanization of the country. The bull weevil outbreak around that time, the massive migration of, of black sharecroppers um, to the north. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you had the the largest one of the the, the largest um, internal migration, absolutely, in the United States was of this era, and one of the largest migrations in history that we're aware of was north to south, black um, black sharecropper and other um, displaced by bull weevil outbreak and 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 in and the industrializing of farming combined uh pushed um for a massive internal migration northward uh during this very same era and the turbulence and unsettling of sentiment about race the civil war uh, you know many veterans still alive uh you know the the all of that still very present right so yes and yes Going back to the map, we're going to head southward now uh, to the to the Jefferson Memorial, and from wet, which we're looking behind now, northward to the Washington Monument. Mm. Uh, that's the White House right there. Okay, and this is a clearing here across this right plaza, so that you can see. So, so the Jefferson Memorial is in clear view from the um, Oval Office. Mm -hmm. um, Jefferson literally looks into the back of the president. Every successive president has Jefferson looking over their shoulder. We'll play around with that in just a moment. Here is the Jefferson uh, uh, statue. In in here, this the statue itself is enormous. It sits on a, I think it's eleven feet tall. It's ten thousand pounds of bronze, and on a six six foot pedestal. So again, like not to the scale of 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 Grant by long shot, but still in keeping with the theme of the man is bigger than life. You approach this statue as you're very small. You know, you're just, you're, you, you know, you're, you're small. Um, and it's almost and certainly intentional. Um, so I say here, statesman, scientist, horticulturist, man of letters in the arts, he owns slaves, yet he's still an ardent proponent of equality and freedom. And here's from the Declaration of Independence. We don't, we're all familiar with, we hold these truths to be self-evident. But in his own life, he was a contradiction um, and very sphinx-like. So, yeah, he stands and poised with, you know, uh, some writing in his hand here. Um, I, and he's looking, again, northward, very much on himself on a mound. This is sort of all, you know, the Washington Monument is built on a, a graded up for um, a floodplain, but also for prominence. The 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 White House is built upward in a prominence. This it, that's natural grade that goes upward. But, but this Jefferson is right smack on the Potomac River. 
and it's it had to be built up substantially for prominence uh so that it's all right and and for flood control um it's to scale of the parthenon it was a three-quarter scale of the roman parthenon but with the modifications that it had open open porticos that let light come all the way in pantheon is dark and it only has light from an aperture at the top that comes down from the sun but here we have light streaming in not unlike a greek temple is what i speculate it's very much like a temple um and, and i play around with that idea so we have jefferson a man of achievement individual achievement and cultural refinement um, we have uh, God the Apollo, uh, uh, Apollo the God in in the Greek um, in the Greek uh, pantheon, uh, who symbolizes also called the sun god, but who symbolizes very much what Jefferson would be associated with: individual achievement, Apollonian features of individual achievement and determination, leavened with, you know, that the Greek the Greek values for cultural refinement, affiliation with the city-state, the polis, um, you know, a, a complete integration of self with 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 communitas, and 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 Jefferson, his certainly his cultural refinement is very much in parallel with the Apollonian virtues that the Greeks held dear, and so I suggest that there's a correspondence here that that he is a kind of American Apollo. <laughs> I leave I the the monument itself hold on it, the the sorry I'm loving this presentation this really um for someone that's not familiar with DC in this um plaza this Washington Mall um area district um space it, it definitely brings things to life um and and it contextualizes things so well so I appreciate it Thank you. Um, the, I should mention the scale. I'll get around that. When we look at the map again next. So you get a sense of how far, what these distances are. Um, it was built, took 1939, 1943. Architect was John Russell Pope. Um, it's a uh, three-quarter scale Roman pantheon, um, but with open colonnade printing light streaming from compass points. It, But the, the stairs are spectacular. You walk on the, you come to this monument, and these stairs just keep going like a cascade, like a waterfall. I mean, it's just, you know, it just, and, and it's it very carefully designed to distract you from understanding. It's all an artificial landscape. It's all built up to give you right. It, you, so it's very Disneyland in in an, in a lot of ways, really. Mm -hmm. Um. So we we we've, we've, all right. Here's the so Kiko. The full distance here is is uh, two is um, is uh, this is I believe this is two miles from from east to west. This is a full two mile. This uh, distance from White House to Jefferson is three quarters of a mile, so it gives you a sense of the scale. Mm -hmm. Big, it's big. Um, I, I, I should, I, you know, by way of comparison to Tiananmen and, and Red Square, I don't have the off the top of my head. I should by way of comparison to other monumental spaces, um, but it's right up there in scale uh, with with the largest, certainly in the world. Um, if not, you know, this two miles might be the longest of any. That doesn't mean the whole area is bigger. It has a cathedral-like configuration, really. It's got... Um, you know the the um, it, it it it's also called a kite light shape, but it's no mistaking that it has a sort of um, uh, Gothic cathedral basic sort of um, ordinal points, um, for what it's worth. Moving on then to the Lincoln, it built the same period as the as the commissioned and built the same period as the as the. Uh, Grant, um, it is the scale is um, 190 or so by 120 or so feet, and it's 99 feet tall. 99 feet from I don't know where we begin at the base here, probably here to the top, and then we've got yeah the other uh, the 190 this way, uh, yeah. 
as we're looking front, north, south, and then the depth of it is um, 120. Um, the columns at the time denoted the number of states in the Union at the time of Civil War, I believe. Um, so they had the, the, the they had 30 some columns around this to denote the states of the Union at the time. Um, the, the style is as with the other neoclassical Greco-Roman architect Henry Bacon. Here I was there in 2003 doing my reconnaissance. Um, actually, no, I was doing this reconnaissance later. In any event, this was this was prior to this wasn't 2003. I took these pictures while I was doing reconnaissance for the topography uh, images for my father. Uh, he wanted he sent me on a he sent me on a mission to go photograph the whole the whole area and get a sense for his ideas to get a sense for what we were going to do. Um, So we'll start back here. The, the, the reflecting pool, a uh, major feature of this monument plaza was, was drained for construction of the World War II Memorial, which is behind us in this image. It is eastward. Uh, and, and, and again, one of those monuments that, um, that was, the la it was the last monument in this precinct, this primary one, this precinct number one that was permitted uh, under the amendment, 2003 amendments. Uh, so the, the World War II Memorial, enormous pressure to put that in, um, is right at the center of the mall now, uh, but it dates to construction in 2000. Later than that, it, the construction, I forget when it was completed, but these, this photograph was taken in 2010, I believe. Now, okay, so we're moving. Does have an official name right there? What, what is the, it's, it's the reflecting pond. Yeah, okay. it was. It's been called. It's been called just the reflecting pond, Lincoln Memorial reflecting pond. It was part of the the construction uh, commission for the Lincoln Memorial. And yeah. is that water so, natural, or is that is that coming from the Potomac, or is that manufactured man made? I follow your question. It's pumped in, and what I'm standing in is like, you know, this this was residual. It had been drained. It's very shallow. It's maybe a foot deep at at the at, at, right at the at most. But it was a unique opportunity to walk across it uh, because it was drained for the construction at the other end. Usually it's and still now it's filled with water, but not very deep. You can see the curb, the curb depth is not much. And then it's it's it, its basin is maybe another foot lower. Oh, wow. We're going to very shallow. We're going to walk up to it. Now we've walked this way and we're much closer and you get again and get a sense how it's graded for dramatic effect and floodplain issues. The Potomac is just, you know, a couple hundred yards westward of here. And by then it'd been very, you know, it's been very engineered for flood control since. So flooding is not nearly the issue it was, of course. Um, they got a seawall and other stuff. But back then, this is how they managed for it. They had, they had seawalls, they, you know, but it was very expensive to build and I, and they didn't have, you know, concrete poured in place. So I don't know how at that time if they had any flood flood wall containment then. Um, th this is we're looking up and we see the dark and so distinctive from what we saw of the Jefferson Memorial, which is light streams in from everywhere. The Lincoln's very different. It's much more like a funeral crypt. It's much more like a sepulcher or, or crypt. It seems to me. And and here, but very similar in it design, it has this sort of cascade of steps that are very dramatic, pronouncing your arrival and how small you are. And you get closer, it's still very dark. You can begin, I don't know from where you sit, begin to see the silhouette outline of Lincoln mm -hmm. beyond. But then as you get up, something very magical happens. It's quite dark and your eyes are adapted to the light outside. But then you walk inside and seamlessly, gradually, that they they it's 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 very old technology it's used it was used in lighthouses for magnifying light um it it it's uh let's light come down below the sidewalk into the storage for any number of storefront operations the same technology is in the lincoln memorial and it's beautiful it lets light just very gradually your eyes adjust so that lincoln lincoln materializes very magically as you walk up walk into the 
into the. Oh my the, gosh! Wow, that's that's amazing. I'm glad this you, is, you recuperated that last point because we lost connection momentarily. But oh, um, I totally got the sense of what you're describing with your concluding statement right there. So we walk up. I'm just using telephoto, so it's getting pixelated here. But you, you, you know, there he is, and you know, on either side is and again significant the geography so on the on the south wall is inscribed the gettysburg address which is a which is a martial statement that makes very clear that this war is going to be is not going to be in vain that that it is rather as he concludes quite famously in his gettysburg it is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion <clears throat> the honored dead were gettysburg after the battle that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain that this nation under god shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. This was a rewriting of the Declaration of Independence, as many historians have acknowledged and recognized. He was restating the Declaration. This was a, re a revivification, a resuscitation, a enunciation of the Declaration of Independence, updated for facing the, the crises that the founders knew very well was coming. They knew that slavery was a contradiction that could not be lived down. They knew that they had to face it. They made their compromises at the founding, and it was contested. And whereas, you know, sort of the, in, the, the, the heron folk, racist European, you know, mindset was shared really by pretty much by all of them, Slavery as an institution was not shared by all of them as something valued and, and important. Slavery had been essentially dead in Europe for centuries. Bonded slavery had been dead in Europe for centuries. Um, that it was resuscitated was an artifact of colonialism in South America. And you know, right, Brazil had slavery under law until 1881. It had it for another 20 years. 1888 uh, is when it ended. Was it 1888? I'm sorry. 1888, 1888. and then Cuba is 1886. In Puerto Rico, 1873. Another, as it were, generation beyond the Civil War in, in the U.S. And so here it is, the Gettysburg Address revivifying the Declaration of Independence on the South Wall, addressing that which came nominally from the South in the telling of the story. To get you get back to your earlier sort of question about what my impressions of DC as a Southern, Southern or Northern, it's clear that the that the Monument Plaza largely signifies the victory of the North. It largely signifies for the for the southerner so many of them even to this day right the war of northern aggression <laughs> you know it 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 celebrates the you know what they consider you know a terroristic act against them, I, as it were right so but on the southern wall there's no mistake why it was on the southern wall it was it was it was doubling down on uh, the founding of a new covenant addressed to the South. On the North, this is second inaugural. Um, they're both about the same length. Uh, second inaugural is remarkable for being the shortest inaugural uh, address in history and almost certainly the most poetic. It's worth reading again. You know, at least one book has been written, dedicated entirely to, that I read for preparation of all this, dedicated entirely and exclusively to the, it's ironic, an entire book written for the shortest speech ever in American history. It may seem strange that any men should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces, but let us judge not that we not be judged. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. 
Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses, which in the providence of God must needs come, but which, having continued through his appointed time, um, he now wills to remove, and that he gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came, shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in the living God always ascribe to him? This could be taken in so many ways. Mm -hmm. He concludes, Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. He wasn't above himself rhyming some simple verse. <laughs> Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsmen's, the slaves, 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with a sword. As was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So here he vests the Almighty himself as the arbiter of this great conflict. Right? And you know, it's a very political move to make, you know, he had to signal the South. By then, by now, the war was going to be over, and the North was definitely going to win. It's just a matter of, of, of weeks. And he, 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 his, he understands his role, right, is to now repatriate the country, you know, to, you know and not, not be, not be, un, uh, not be uh, cruel in, in his in his account of from whence this war cometh, you know, and who is to blame. And, you know, plenty of blame to go all around. You know, capturing to some, in some ways, your sentiment expressed earlier, the North was, in so many ways, very culpable for slavery. It was part of an, an, an industrial complex, yeah, uh, that that benefited from, um, from, uh, uh, that benefited from it from the from the economics of slavery to a certain extent. And so it, it was very much incorporated into that. Mm -hmm. So he he is of course very aware of this. He was he did not accept the sentiment of the time then emerging around um the around you know what would be what would become you know, in the 1870s, 1880s, you know, so the Marxist, you know, critique of capital. He, but it was the sentiment was very much there decades before, had been around for decades, that that wage slavery was a rare, very real artifact of the American way of of capital accumulation, and and in fact, it was essential, absolutely essential to it. And everyone who worked wage understood this. Lincoln refused that 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 analogy to slavery bonded slavery he said you cannot compare the two there's no way you can say that making wage uh, however bitter it may be for the time spent doing it is in any way comparable to bonded slavery you, you just can't right he refused to accept that that's an interesting conversation mm -hmm. you know tangential a bit here Getting to the sculpture, here he is, also large. Um, you see the, the human scale people standing right up. These are children standing, uh, you may be three feet tall here, three feet, four feet tall. And, and you know, we can do the, interpolate the math of how large he is. He is staring down that, and it's striking when you come in that if you're anywhere five, six feet tall, it looks, it feels when the light adjust for you as you walk in past the colonnade that he's looking right through you 
you know, he's he is looking right, man. He's just a thousand yard stare right through you, and that's no mistake. His head is tilted downward. Jefferson's head is kind of his chin is jutted outward. Grant is a sort of parallel tracked. Lincoln's looking slightly downward. Why? Again, we can have all sorts of interpretations why. There's been many. Other features here are significant. His hands, one hand is open, his right hand is open, kind of laid over this, this pedestal that's that is nominally a chair, right? But obvious, but in, in in effect, it's very much a pedestal for the for the statue. It's both ends. In one hand, one case the hand is sort of laying over, the other, the the finch, the the, the fist is clenched. The one interpretation is that it's a sign language for Abraham Lincoln, A and L, that the uh, um, and I forget which is which, but that one is the A and the other is the L. Mm-hmm. In in uh, in sign language, I should know. I should have this memorized. This is this has some merit because he was a. Um, there was a lo- there was the uh, a deaf person's lobby that had uh, that he had sentiment for. Lincoln had sentiment for. It. He had been approached to support uh, uh, the the funding, building, procuring of support, financial support for a deaf school, and that um, Chester French, I think, had affiliation to this, um, if not by direct family experience. Otherwise, I'm trying to recall now. And that he gave for Lincoln this sort of sign language as uh, to signify that others have interpreted interpreted this sculpting differently. That one hand clenched denotes um, determination to finish something, and you know, sort of as it were, sort of rumination on unfinished as we do clench our hands in those moments. And the other hand is resolve, resignation, um, a sort of pathos, a sort of both and. So that he's embodying, on the one hand, determination, and on the one hand, a, a recognition of something so large that you can only lean back, right? And the hand is perhaps bracing him for leaning back. There's another part of this that's significant, his feet. One foot has both heel and toe on flat on the ground of the, right? The other has the toe pitched upward. Why? Mm-hmm. The, 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 you know, so I'm one, ob- it seems to be an obvious conclusion here is you don't know whether he just sat down or he's about to get up. Mm-hmm. Why would a sculptor do that? So I, again, I'm just playing with ideas here, right? We've got the second inaugural, we've got Gettysburg Address, we've got one hand clenched with determination, another hand sort of relaxed perhaps, or perhaps not, perhaps it's bracing a repose to recline. They are, though, in sort of visual tension with each other. They are mm-hmm. in symbolic tension with each other. They are yeah, kinesthetically in tension with each other. And then you see the foot, the boot. The toe is lifted. Okay, so playing around like we did with Jefferson, I want to uh, size up and wrap up here. Lincoln Memorial looks east towards the Washington Monument. Here you have the reflecting pond, Kiko, fully filled with water, and you get a sense of how huge it is. Mm -hmm. And this was part of the original design. It was part of the commission for the original design of the memorial. And here we look, we we are looking down from the top of the Lincoln Memorial at the top at grade with his with where people enter the temple. And I'm taking a photograph looking, looking eastward. And he, and I'm turning, and I what a struck when I first got there. I looked at Lincoln, and then as I did with Jefferson, I with Jefferson, I looked up at Jefferson. I'm like, well, what's he looking at, right? And with Jefferson, I've got to mention, 
I turned around and looked down and I go, well, I'm pretty sure he's looking as far south, as far north as he can. And I knew what was north was Washington, was the, was the, was the White House. And when I later studied this, I discovered that the grade of his monument was built just slightly above the White House so that Jefferson could look just a little bit down and at it. Now, here's Lincoln. Unlike Jefferson, Lincoln is clearly looking downward. He's mm -hmm. seated. We don't know if he just got, he's about to get up because something's unfinished that he's got to get at, or if he's reclining because he's seen he has seen the nation through the tragic circumstances determined at its origin that Hegel would give account and Marx would put a pithy point on, as I opened earlier. Mm -hmm. Now, he's looking not left, right, or in the middle, but apps in my gaze that I engineered of him, I said, where is he looking? I turned, he's looking directly at the bottom of the Washington Monument. I'm pretty sure that Chester French designed his memorial not to look left or right or in the middle as if he's staring directly back at Ulysses S. Grant, but that he receives Grant's gaze from beyond the monument, the Washington Monument, he receives it in a sense, and he redirects it down to the base of the monument. Now, why would he be redirecting to the base of the monument? If you assume that Grant and Lincoln are, in a sense, in, in, in dialogue, in, they're, they're in connection with each other. They were built at the same time. They were very close compatriots in the, in the prosecution of the Civil War. They, they were fond of each other. Um, they counted on each other under some of the most treacherous, miserable circumstances the country has has had the courage to face, right, in this sort of, right, making symptomatic its hypocrisy. The conditions of slavery were far worse than anything any of these men ever faced in their life. But what they did was they brought the nation to symptomatic of that that obscene cruelty and hypocrisy, right? They brought the nation to symptom, to fever pitch. And a body that, that is under the influence of symptoms is, is turbulent. It's convulsing. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's aware it has a disease and it's registering the disease. Diseases that are latent, people can be walking around with them and, and dying silently. If they don't register the symptoms, they don't. Their body doesn't internally react, and they don't consciously deal with their disease. So, in a sense, these two these two guys are on this mall, as Griswold would 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 summarize really eloquently in the piece that I that I reference in the in my article, and that was influential to me thinking this through. You know. That they're, they were designed to talk to each other. But Lincoln is looking down. Maybe, maybe Grant was looking for a signal from Lincoln. Let's play with that. Maybe he's looking westward through the fog of distance and time and history, through the obelisk, which there's no getting past. But the obelisk also has a kind of apparitional presence here. It's there, it serves no structural function. It has been denoted in some interpretations as a beam of light from the heavens that comes that was cast down in the forging of this great nation. It's otherwise interpreted as just another phallic centric mm -hmm. sort of, you know, in the Egyptian tradition, right, of phallic centric uh, potentates to signify a potentate. Okay, whatever. That's the least interesting. But here's Lincoln's directing, you know, you know, uh, assembling the gaze between himself, let us say, and 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 Grant, and bringing it to a dead stop at the base of the obelisk, which is the foundational beginning of the country. In one, and it is the Washington is the right denotes the beginning. They didn't do a statue to Washington; they did a fucking obelisk. Sorry, if I can swear. <laughs> on the 
you know, they did an obelisk and, and why now I'm sure in historians could give more or less explicit reasoning of what the influences were. Maybe very banal and mundane. It's like, well, they needed something really big and a statue wouldn't do it visually. They needed something that, that situated the monument mall in ways that signified future ambitions in all sorts of ways. They needed something really abstract and geometric that that was transcendent beyond an individual. I, who know? I, I'm sure there's all sorts of right. Architecturally, it's very difficult to work with, as my father would say. It's just really difficult to get around the blunt force sort of, you know, sort of dominance of that obelisk architecturally and what to do with it. It's it's so it's such a brute force thing. One reason why it's never been finished is how do you architecturally deal with that kind of design presence? Okay. The way one one way I like seeing this is that Grant was looking for his lat the final signal from Lincoln. Is this thing done? Are we done? We've been through a lot. Are we done? Lincoln might just about to be get up to respond to his general. He might be sitting back. Either way, he's communicating with us. Mm -hmm. And so we're left, I think, quite beautifully, quite poetically, and quite genius, ingeniously by the by the um, sculptors together with an ambiguous message that Griswold really caught. Are we done? Are we ever going to be done? Yes, we had a war. Is it finished? What? Now what? Link and Lincoln looks to the founding of the nation. Forever for a new beginning. Always to remind us that we have to keep alive our interpretation of the beginning, our understanding, because it's such an enigma for us in history. It's contradictions, it's hypocrisies, it's acclamations, it's aspirations, it's uh, transcendence before the world community as a shining light for the, as it were, what Jürgen Habermas would call the emancipatory project of the Enlightenment. It, it, is, is, is it all of that? Is it some of it? You know? And it was this, Kiko, maybe we, I, so much we could continue saying, I think we're running out of time, but it was this, we haven't said anything about the design, and maybe we could make this a two-parter. It was this, it was when I saw this, and I was able to put this together. Actually, I had not seen backup. I had not seen the Grant Memorial. I had not seen it when I had my lightning bolt, whatever. I had not seen the Grant, but I had seen the Lincoln, and I'd seen the Jefferson. And I had been reading Nietzsche at the time. And I, the idea of tragedy, the idea that tragedy is this is this ineffable force in history, and in Nietzsche's formulation, it is the transection of the the uh, Apollonian aspirations of refinement and individual achievement with the inevitable, the inexorable, um, indefatigable forces that destroy us. That that always humble us like Icarus before the sun. You know, that we the higher we try to fly, the more we 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 underestimate right our hubris and fundamental to the Greek tragic condition, right? The human aspirations that always overween beyond their their and, and forget, lose track of how trapped we are by the circumstances of our mortality. How trapped we are by the by the beguilement of our ego wishes and gratifications, you know how captive we are at the same time that we're transcendent. So it it gets back full circle. 
when I saw Jefferson and Lincoln, I saw Lincoln looking down to the beginning of the country, and I sat at that bench, myself not a little bereft for my circumstances, myself working through my family history, not yet aware, as my my uh, generous sister would help assist me with understanding that there is this, there is this, there is that ineffable force that binds us together, that which defies words, defies expression, defies a definitive closure that is a binding nonetheless. And here we have this monument mall with its Greco-Roman yeah, plantation architecture on the one hand and tributes to a slaveholder and extraordinary hypocrite on the one hand. On the other hand, himself truly devoted to his to to one side of the contradiction, captive to his place in history to the other, to a certain extent, right? He was a creature of his own time. And, mm -hmm. and our, as we are able to talk about, I can share with you my how I summarized Jefferson and, and his place in all of this iconography with the monument proposal that my father and I came up with. Him and then Lincoln, himself captive of his time, himself bitterly criticized by abolitionists as, as being as stolid and slow going and backpedaling, and you know serpentine in his uh, in his commitments on, on the one hand, and the antebellum folks considering him this 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 terrorist against their you know this this terrorist this this great betrayer of of the of the great covenant of the declaration of independence yeah you know, it's both and all of that yeah right you have all and 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 yet it is and what i would learn in that in my walking around the mall the most poetic monument in a way and that alerted me to the the what Griswold understood was the Vietnam Memorial because the Vietnam Memorial effaces itself completely. It's black granite. You mm -hmm. re the reflection you get is of yourself in it. You're never really looking at it. You're always looking at yourself, and it's it's a vertex, almost like an architect's compass. It's a vertex. In, cut down into the ground. And one of the criticisms of it was ectonic. It was cut into the earth and it was effeminate, was one of the criticisms of this, right? And it, it, it wasn't statuary. It wasn't statuesque. It was, it was, it was of the earth and feminine and all sorts. And it was Maya Lin was the architect and she was, you know, Vietnamese herself. And you just go on and on. I mean, again, the, the, the legacy, the, 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 the remarkable turbulence around interpretations of this space is extraordinary and it's informative and it's very captivating. Um, it, it, and I'd love someone to do the documentary of the mall, the whole mall. I don't know if ever, anyone's ever been done. It should be um, for the reasons we, we, you've, you've hosted this discussion as I take the challenge you've given, given me. Yeah, it, it, it should be. Um, but you go to the Vietnam Memorial and you see how what it does is one vertex points you directly to the north east corner of the Lincoln Memorial, clearly, no mistake. And the other one vertex tapers in an exaggerated um, vanishing point, very deliberately for an optical illusion, brilliantly to the northwest corner of the Washington Monument. It, it, the, the, the Lincoln, the Vietnam Memorial is saying, get a load of this entire space. Because if you want to understand why, if you don't want to understand why you're standing here, your reflection in black granite, ineluctably, your gaze tapers this way to an exaggerated van vanishing point in two directions. And what exaggerated vanishing points do as an optical illusion is they pull the focal point at the end of the vanishing point forward to you, making it look bigger and closer. Not an accident. Maya Lin was her own genius, and she understood that the whole story, that the singular story can only be understood by the whole story. 
you can only assimilate the moment by the whole arc. Getting back to Martin Luther King, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Any given point along the arc is imperceptible as an arc. Its geometry cannot be discerned in the compass of a singular experience in that space. You can only understand it from a distance. You can't see the arc that it is an arc, but from a distance in Martin Luther King's point in time. It takes time to, to acquire that perspective. But architecturally, also, if you stand in front of a tapered arc, <clears throat> what you're looking at seems like a flat wall. <clears throat> you may know that it's an arc because you can see it bend this way and that way, but actually what you're looking at in front of you is flat. So it was that that, you know, sort of all of those things just sort of after this sort of walking the mall and my own this and that personal and biographic, there's got to be an arc there. And the arc has got to connect. The arc has got to connect Jefferson, Sphinx, contradictorial. It's got to repatriate what was on the one hand, his straight ordinal view towards freedom as characterized in the film Lincoln in that in that exchange with what's his name in Lincoln with Lincoln and the senator uh true north but it had to bend across the long arc of history because Jefferson in his own time in his own space in his own place couldn't wouldn't didn't but history maybe can repatriate him in a way not unlike the second inaugural by Lincoln seeks to be magnanimous. It seeks not to recriminate or to call out South or North as the originator of the offense that must cometh. Martin Luther King, certainly not that guy. And repatriating through the arc that Martin Luther King bestowed us as an image for our time, if not all time. So the arcing wall cut down into the ground that we'll get to next time, acknowledges the genius of Maya Lin's Vietnam Memorial, <laughs> recapitulates that design syntax, signifies that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts in the wash in our story in our lives in our futures but as i hope to get to we had better come to terms with the tragic we had better have the courage to face as with powell justice powell saying in order to get past race we must give full account of how we invented it there is no other way. You can declare post-racial. You can, you can come up with any rationalizations you want, all of them dead end up against an Oedipal dilemma, which is the more you try to avoid something, the more you come smack dab in the front of it. Whit Marsalis said this about race perhaps with Oedipus in mind. I don't know. But he said this about race, and it's, it, he said it in the opening episode of Jazz, the documentary uh, by one of the Burns brothers. I don't know which Burns it was. There's two of those documentaries. The guy did one, and it's the same guy that did Civil War, I think. There was baseball, jazz, Civil War, these major PBS productions, right? The first episode of Jazz... I was told by a, a, a jazz musician, friend of mine, was he said, Matt, if you want to watch one episode, just watch that one. It pretty much tells the whole story. You need to know. What is, but Wynton Marsalis had a major, was a major influence on the production of that documentary. And so he has words to speak at the front end of it. I think we're out of time. I'll leave off there. Yes, um, I'm sorry to cut you off, but we have to continue um for sure next week. Um, my audience is definitely going to be anticipating um I re um, encounter kind of a continuation of what we talked about today and a transition into um, Charles Mills, this philosopher that we've been alluding to a lot.
throughout the episode, especially at the beginning of the episode. But um, is there like a final like thought or anticipation that you want to leave with the audience to kind of um have them thinking of something before we go into the next um episode next week? This uh, monument uh, experience um, and design competition was one of the two greatest, um, most important episodes in my life. Um, in my career, definitely, there was one. Of, it's one of the two most important um, episodes of in my career and, you know, in my life. I'd say uh, uh, this experience with the Capitol Mall and having the opportunity to ruminate over it, study it closely and assimilate it into my own thinking, personal biography, work with my father very closely in this and others at University of Laverne. And I will give account of them when we talk again and how there was the design proper was my father and I, we were Lennon and McCartney, but there was definitely influences beyond that that brought the whole thing to fruition. So um, we'll get into that next time. I guess I leave off with that. I, uh, I There's no words can fully express what this all has meant to me. And I have continued teaching, using it with some success, I think, uh, along the lines of, you know, of distilling, you know, how, you know, the past is never dead. It's not even past. <laughs> so I, that's... <laughs> For what it's worth. Thanks for asking. No, um, that's a that that statement resonated with me when you showed the presentation earlier. But um, again, audience, um, we're gonna be joined again with um, Professor Witt next week. We're gonna work the arrangements with that. We have so many episodes coming up; it's not even funny. But I can't plan too far ahead because, um, I'm really the only one calling the shots and setting up the interviews and conducting the interviews and doing all the research and stuff so i appreciate the audience patience people have been asking you know when this um bombardment of episodes are going to come out but at the same time it's good that people aren't getting so much at the same time because we have busy lives and um i have been putting in them out pretty consistently these episodes but um the episode 100 is actually going to be my father he's coming on um for a special episode 100 appropriately because we're going to talk about some things that uh, Professor Witt alluded to earlier with his um, late dad, Marvin Witt, about his experience with, um, you know, some of the Black people, you know, in Oregon. I think you say he was born in 1937. My father was born in 27. 27. He, was 10, he was 10 years old when they came from the Dust Bowl of, of the Panhandle of Texas to Oregon, very much in the Grapes of Wrath period, exactly, and for the same reasons, but they didn't go south, they didn't go to California on a tip from a drifter, that's another story, that um, they shouldn't go south. It was a grift. It was a hustle, and it was brutal, um, brutal farm labor conditions that they would face if they went south, and they'd be br met by, by the brutality at that time towards who were called the Okies. So that's how they'd be treated, and they and very much a story told in Grapes of Wrath. They ended up trying to get to Seattle on the tip, they didn't. They they got there, but didn't work out. They ran out of money on their way down, and and ended up in Portland. And so he dad was there in 1937, ten years old, and uh, he was. They they were you know, um, you know, um, decamp from Panhandle and looking for a place to where they could live. They rented a place in what is now, what was then called the Albina community, and they were sort of right smack dab in the center of the east side of the river community I'm like a tough share, area kind of a tough kind of a tough area back I'm then share a similar story that actually connects with your dad's story um the next time we talk because i think it's appropriate because it would also span the same time period that my dad is going to start talking about in our conversation in episode 100 which would be the integration period of the 60s my dad was born in 1955 and so he saw a lot of important things in his childhood as far as um, the United States is concerned. But there's some overlap. We will talk about that then. But um, just to introduce some subsequent guests, um, S.L. Canton will be coming on Thursday, um, based in Bangalore, India. He's a geopolitical analyst. We have so much to talk about in the world of geopolitics. Um, we have some, like I said, just major guests coming down the road. I can't even tell you how many people I have booked. Um, 
but there are quite a few people. But I just want to make um, note of some of the people that I know that are coming up very soon. And again, Professor Witt's coming on again um, next week. My dad's coming on. Um, ben Sadagatfar is coming on as well. He's been on the show three different times. And um, we just have so many eclectic guests with a lot of different perspectives. And um, I would tell um, Matt's audience, alongside um, the people who are listening, uh, subscribe for free on Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. You have nothing to lose to subscribe to this um, YouTube channel. We're an independent platform. We're growing very fast. Um, and we want to reach 20,000 subs by the end of 2024. And um, we believe that that's a realistic goal. Um, if people are doing the promotion, you know, just word of mouth is so powerful. And we appreciate that um, just word of mouth um, influence. And hopefully it gets to more people. People are recognizing us. Larger accounts are following our channel. I'm not going to mention any names. Uh, people follow us um, as a phantom presence as a way. I don't know why, you know, people are doing that. People do have their own agendas and stuff, and that's fine. But um, people are watching Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum, and larger accounts do know us. We've had some um, pretty big names on the forum already, so it will make sense that people know who we are. But um, sharing the information, subscribing for free goes a long way to helping us out as well. And we want to get to those 1,000 subs because with the 1,000 subs, we get the YouTube um, ad revenue directly as far as the monetization. So we don't even have to ask for donations from the public at that point. So that's what we're trying to do here. We are trying to grow. We will grow and get to that point. But um, we just want to say thank you again, Professor Whip, for coming back on to episode 97. This will be published today within the next few hours. I'm going to send you the email so you can alert everyone. So this will get out very quickly. And so all the episodes coming up, the next 20 or so episodes will be published pretty much the same day. But I just want to say thank you again, um, Professor Webb, for joining us today. And we're going to talk very soon. My pleasure, Kiko. L looking forward. Thank you so much for your gracious time. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I have to go get my son right now and my niece. But um, I just want to say beautiful people. Enjoy the rest of your day. And stay tuned to Kiko's Free Thing is Forum. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. We'll talk soon, okay? All right, Kiko. Okay. You take care. care.